a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. Here's another in NBC's great parade of new shows. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you're about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide. There's a mad killer at large in your city. A woman has been brutally slain, the body mutilated. The picture is clear. The killer has a thirst for blood. Your job, get him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, transcribed in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, January 12th. It was raining in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrang, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from the morgue, and it was 11.23 p.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Hi, Joe. Chief wants to see you. He's in there with Romero. Thanks, Chandler. How's the wife? Fine. How about your mother? Better, thanks. Hi, Joe. Hi. Down in. Sit down. Did they post the body in? In the morning. Pretty messy. Strangled and mutilated. The guy's a maniac, Skipper. The body shows it. A uh, murder like this? Anybody's a suspect. The coroner looked at the body. He says the weapon was a long, sharp instrument. Found her in a hotel down on East 3rd Street. Manager's son discovered her about 7.30. You talked to him? It was too much for him. He passed out. Manager wasn't home. We'll check with him before midnight. Close to it now, Joe. We better get going. All right. The boys from the crime lab check the room? They're still down there, Ed. The place is a mess. Get back as soon as you can. We're working straight through on this thing. That's a hot shot. I'll get it. At the Lux Hotel, room 219, corner of South Grand and Cordova. Dead body. Possible homicide. The Lux Hotel, room 219, corner of South Grand and Cordova. A dead body. What is it, Friday? Lux Hotel, possible homicide. Busy night. Yeah. You coming, Ed? Right. Let's go. Six minutes later, Ed Backstrand, Ben, and I pulled up in front of the Lux Hotel. The manager met us at the door and led the way up a narrow stairway to the second floor. The room number was 219. We were prepared for the worst. We got it. You're right, Romero. The guy must be a maniac. 2 hotels, two murders. The same M.O. Three of us made a brief inspection of the room at the Lux Hotel. We took a few notes on the appearance of the girl's body and a brief description. Apparently, she'd been strangled to death first, and then her body brutally mangled. Ben and I went back down to the lobby, and the manager of Mr. Ford showed us the house book. The girl was registered together with a man, Mr. and Mrs. Philip Grant. We took the hotel register to have it checked for fingerprints and to photostat the handwriting. Ben notified the crime lab, then we went back to the room and questioned the manager. Mr. and Mrs. Philip Grant, that's all I know. I never saw either one of them before tonight. When did they check in, Mr. Ford? About three hours ago. That's right, about nine. Maybe a little before. Did they register together? Yeah, a little before nine. They came in together. Did you let them in the room? 
Yes, sir, like I always do. It's a small place here, maybe not first class, but I treat people right. What did the man look like? Do you remember? I think so. Kind of tall. Young, maybe 30 or so. Husky fellow. Had a mustache. How tall would you say, Mr. Ford? Oh, about your height, Wade. Must have been at least 180. Seemed like a nice fella. Would you know him if you saw him again? I think so. People sure don't act like they look. You think it was him? Can you think of anybody else? Well, no. I never saw him before tonight, either one of them. I don't know anything about it. Did you notice anything in particular about them when they came in? Well, he didn't show it, but it looked like she'd been drinking a little. Giggling, you know. And you didn't see this man Grant leave the hotel? No, I didn't. I must have been checking the account books back of the desk. Guess he got by me. Is there a back entrance to the hotel, Mr. Ford? No, he had to come out this way, all right. How about the fire escape? I never thought of that. Say, I bet you cops think I'm trying to hide something. How did you happen to find the body? I don't know anything about it, honest. I've been running the hotel for ten years now. Everybody knows me around here. You can ask at the bank. All right, Mr. Ford. Now, would you mind telling us how you happened to find the body? I don't want a lot of lousy newspaper publicity. Give the place a bad name. Can you blame me? The newspapers won't get your name from us. All we want to know is how you happened to find the body. Well, I told you. It's a small place here, but I like to treat people right. A couple hours after they checked in, I remembered I forgot to fill the ice water pitcher in the room. So I got some and took it up. The door was opened a little ways. It's got a bad catch on it. And the lights were on. I peeked in, and there she was. She was... Well, the guy must have been crazy. Do you remember what time it was when you found her? Well, just before I called the cops, about half past eleven, I guess. All right, Ford, that's all for now. When the other officers get here, show them up, will you? Yes, sir, I sure will. Romero? Yes, Giver? Get on the phone downstairs and call the Metropolitan Division. Have them send us every available man from the reserve unit. We're going to patrol the area for the rest of the night. Right, Chief. least we can do is make it hard for him. <laughs> Two murders in seven hours. Yeah. Both of them in a three-block radius. Yeah, same pattern. It's got to be the same guy. All right, we've got a description. What do you think? Well, when the reserve unit shows up, have them cover this whole section of town. Pick up everybody who even comes close to that guy's description. All right, Ed. It's got to go fast. We can't lose a minute. One hour either way, it, it might mean another body. Like this one. Nine minutes later, at four minutes past midnight, the men from the crime lab showed up. It started to drizzle. They went over the room in detail. They dusted everything in the room for fingerprints, the walls, the doors, the fixtures in the bathroom, the lamps, chairs, everything. They took samples of the girl's blood and her lipstick. Small pieces of flesh and human hair were found under the girl's fingernails. The nails were scraped carefully and the contents put in an envelope, marked and sealed. Ed Backstrand ordered pictures taken of the room and the girl's body from different angles. Every object in the room that could have any possible tie-in with a murder was photographed. It was raining. The rear of the hotel where the fire escape was overlooked a vacant lot. Ben had a hunch. While the lab men were at work, we left the hotel and circled around into the lot for a look at the ground directly underneath the fire escape ladder. It was raining hard now. Must be an easier way to make a living. Mud's almost up to my knee. Mine too. Watch your step. You see any prints? No. Wait till my wife sees these new shoes. Put it on your expense account. Oh, real fun. Ben, get that light over here. Look. Yeah. Good set of prints. Lucky that rain didn't start turning to wash them out by now. Yeah. Hand me that cover from the trash can over there. I'll cover them. Wait a minute. What? Here, on the edge of the fire escape ladder. Small hunk of cloth. Man suit? Well, it looks like it. Might have caught himself in that sharp corner. <clears throat> I got it. All right, come on, let's get back. Yeah, out of this mud bath. Yo, huh? let me have a light. You catch anything? A hunk of wrapping paper in that trash can. Stains on it. Open it up. Look. Yeah. Butcher knife. We went back to the Lux Hotel, room 219. The lab men were tearing the room apart. It was ten minutes to one. 
We gave the bloodstained knife and the piece of cloth we found on the fire escape to Lieutenant Lee Jones, head of the crime lab. We told him about the footprints just below the fire escape ladder. The knife will help us sew the cloth. I don't know about the footprints. You say you covered them? That's right, Lee. They still look in pretty good shape. Maybe we can do something if the rain hasn't broken them down too bad. Bracken. Yeah, Lieutenant? You and Sloan get downstairs and take a look at those prints. They're good enough. Get a torch, dry them out, and make a cast, right? Okay, Lieutenant. Come on, sir. That's about all I can do for you now, Ed. I think we got everything there is to get. All right, Jones. I'll follow you back to the lab in a couple of minutes. Okay, Ed. Good luck, fellas. Thanks, Lee. We're going to need it. All right, Friday. Romero, it's your baby for the rest of the night. Did he get anything? A few prints, a woman's purse under the bed. Don't know if it's hers or not. No identification. You're going to be at the crime lab, Ed? All night. As soon as we find anything, I'll let you know. Yeah? A gang of cops just came in the lobby. They asked for you. Must be the reserve men from Metropolitan. Tell them we'll be right down, Ford. Okay. You want us to handle it, Ed? That's right. Do just as I told you. Spread them out over the whole area. Cover the streets, the alleys, the flop houses, restaurants, bars, everything. You got a description to go on. Find the man that fits it. Right, Skipper. Don't forget, the guy's a killer twice over. I don't think he'd hesitate on you. Be careful. We went down to the lobby and Ed Backstrand gave the reserve men their orders. Then Backstrand left and Ben and I took over. We picked up another half dozen men in addition to the men in the reserve unit. They were deployed over an area of a dozen square blocks. It was one of the toughest sections of the city. With a general description of the suspect, some of them were to travel on foot, some in cruiser cars. A few minutes before 1 a.m., there was a steady downpour. Visibility was bad. At three minutes past one, the manhunt was on. For the first 30 minutes, Ben and I cruised the general area between East 3rd and College Streets and Alameda and Figueroa. No sign. The rain kept on. We sat and listened to the calls come in. 12A, call your station. 12A, KMA 367. Attention, all units. Recovered license plate in the sixth column. Four young, seven six nine zero. Oh. Forty one R seven eight eight Standard Avenue or three seven three. Forty one R KMA three six seven. Unit seventy one at two eight one six West La Cienega, the five zero seven party. What do you think, Joe? Any hunches? I think he's still around. Somewhere inside these 12 blocks. I'd bet on it. Five? All right, you're on. Want to check out a couple of these bars along here? Getting on the closing time. It's a good idea. Pull over, huh? All right, let's check them for the next couple of blocks, huh? Right. For the next six blocks until closing time, Ben and I checked every bar and every informant we met along the way. The questions got to be automatic. Have you seen a man answering this description? Tall, dark, about 5 feet 11, 180 pounds, well-built, mustache, about 30 years old. The answers got to be automatic, too. Sorry, officer, I hadn't seen him. No, can't remember him. Try the place down the street. We kept on checking the bars until they closed for the night. Then we started on the all-night restaurants and coffee counters. We did plenty of legwork for the next hour. Not a trace. About 2.30, the rain let up a little. And then it started in heavy all over again. That finishes that block. Yeah, I better get the radio on. Yeah. Beautiful weather. By the bucket full. You want to smoke? Hmm, thank you. Control 4, Unit 80K, your location? Yeah, yeah. 80K, your location, KMA 367. That's us, Joe. You want to take it? Yeah, I got it. 80K to Control 4, 80K to Control 4, our location, corner of Alameda and Commercial, KMA 367. 80K, stand by. Something doing. Maybe. No, hold on a minute. Control 4 to 80K, go to the crime lab, code 2. 80K to Control 4, KMA 367. Crime lab. Maybe those prints paid off. Well, I hope so. Let's go. That's 
Killer sure picked fine weather to work in. Feels like I've just been swimming in these clothes. Yeah. I hope those guys in the crime lab have the heater on. A hot bath and a warm bed lead me on. Attention, all units. Hold it. Let's get the radio. All units. All right, double around, Ben. Hit the siren. I'll get the light. Right, hold on. Left turn on the mark, is that right? Yeah, watch out for those track tracks. They're wet. Hold on again. The alley up ahead to your right, huh? All right, pull up, Ben. The street light over there. There you are. All right, come on. Let's go. Here. All right, what happened? Let's have it. This girl, Rita, she was coming home up the street. A man, he tried to grab her. He slashed her coat. Look at her. Her eyes saw him as he ran under the street light. Where'd he go? Uh, down that way, down the alley, over that fence there. A big man. Davis, Davis, you there? Yeah, Joe. All right, Ben, go with Davis. Circle behind the alley. See what you can find. I'll call in. All right, come on, Dave. Yeah. Oh, it's a, look at her face. What's wrong with her? Severe state of shock, it looks like. Get her in the house, huh? I'll call an ambulance. Eighty K to control four. Eighty K to control four. Control four, go ahead. Direct all units in the vicinity to converge on area around St. John's place from Jackson to Banning Street. A woman attacked by a large man with a knife. Suspect left seen on foot. Possibly still in area. Request ambulance. KMA three six seven. Eighty K, Roger, stand by. Attention, all units. Attention, all units. Converge on area around St. John's Place, Jackson to Banning Street. ADK reports woman attacked by a large man with knife. Suspect left seen on foot. In three minutes, the area around St. John's Place was surrounded. For the next hour, the men combed the neighborhood back and forth. Every building, every storehouse in the two square blocks was searched from basement to attic. No trace. The girl, Rita, was hysterical. She could give us only a bare description of her attacker. At 3.45 a.m., a detail was assigned to patrol the area, and the rest of the cars and men were deployed again in the general area from Figueroa to Alameda Street and East 3rd to College Street. The manhunt went on. So did the rain. At 3.54, Ben and I checked in at the Old City Jail Building, second floor, the crime lab. Chief Ed Backstrand and Lee Jones were waiting for us. Heard about the call. How'd he get away? Not sure it was him, Skipper. How do you mean? Well, the girl wasn't hurt bad for one thing. No attempted strangling. For another thing, the guy stole her purse. That doesn't sound like a man we're after. Did you get a description from the girl? Didn't jibe too well what she gave us. She was pretty hysterical. And you raked the neighborhood good? Every corner. Not a sign. Do you find anything? Yeah. Jones? Yeah, Ed. Fill them in, will you? Not one print on that knife you found, boys. Blood, but not a print. Your killer's crazy like a fox. And how about the scrapings from the girl's fingernails, Lee? Didn't help too much. Rarely do. Not enough to go on. Got to have a fair-sized bit of flesh to run it for papal ridges. All we found under the girl's fingernails are small bits of skin. Yeah. She probably scratched the guy up some. Might have drawn blood. We had more luck with the footprints. You get an impression? Right out the ground with torches and cast them. About size 10B. That's fine, Lee. But how about the prints? Only good one was a thumb. Real good. Got it off the wall near the light switch in the bathroom. You classified yet? Yep. Found it in our single fingerprint file. The print belongs to a man by the name of Long. Robert Long. You got a record, Ed? Yeah. Misdemeanor. Two arrests for drunkenness last October. Petty theft in December. The mama sheet shows a dishonorable discharge from the United States Coast Guard in 1946. Age 29... 192 pounds, 5 feet 10 inches, dark hair, dark eyes. That's close enough. We got even closer, Joe. Long works as a counterman at the Cottage Cafe down on South Flower. Started there last week on the early morning shift, but he didn't show up for work last night. Good. Where'd you get the tip? The knife you boys found. It didn't have any prints, but it had a brand on it. We ran it down. It was taken from the Cottage Cafe. Mm-hmm. Any address on this Robert Long yet? Yeah, got it from his boss. Rooming house on East 1st. Landlady says he hasn't been home in two nights. Yeah, now we wait. Rooming house is staked out and so is the cottage cafe, just in case Long decides to show up for work this morning. What time you got, Romero? Mm, six minutes past four. All right. We've got every indication that Robert Long's the man we're after. His description, fingerprints, the knife, the footprint, his size. Maybe we're wrong. I don't think so. How about a motive, Ed? I think Robert Long likes to kill. He's thirsty for it. 
None of the victims were criminally attacked. They were strangled. Bodies mutilated. How about robbery? No. Two of the women he killed had money in their purses. He didn't touch it. Well, what's next, Skipper? Back on the street? Figueroa to Alameda. He's third to College Street. Keep an net around that area and work it back and forth until we're positive he's not inside. I think he is. At ten minutes past four a.m., Ed Baxter and Ben and I left the crime lab and drove to the surrounded area. It was still raining. We passed several patrolmen from the reserve unit making the rounds. They didn't look any more comfortable than we felt. At Broadway and Alpine Street, Ben and I got out and started patrolling on foot again. Backstrand followed in the car to maintain a radio check. We must have covered two dozen blocks and a half a dozen coffee counters before we got to the Criterion Restaurant and Donut Shop, a few blocks up the street from the Cottage Cafe. Hey, Skipper. You want to take a minute for some hot coffee? I'll keep an ear on the radio. You two go ahead. You look drenched. Yeah, we are. Will we bring you some back in a paper carton? Fine, thanks. Cream. No sugar. All right, Ed. Come on, Ben. Place is empty. Yeah. Yes, sir, gentlemen. What'll it be? Hot coffee? Yeah, there's two of us here. Can you fix up one to go? Sure thing. Say, on that one to go, cream, no sugar. Right. Say, you fellas cops? Yeah, why? No offense. Just wondering. Here you are. Thank you. Cop in uniform was around a couple hours ago. Wanted to know if I'd seen some guy he was looking for. Tall, about 190 pounds, mustache, about 30 years old. Yeah, that's the description he gave me. He, he was looking for the guy. So are we. Say, that's good. That other cop came in right at my busiest time, a little after two when the bars closed. You know, it gets pretty rushed, and I didn't have much time to think, so I just said no. And then after the cop left, I remembered. You saw a man answering that description tonight? Yeah. I would have told the cop, but I was rushed. You know how it is. No time to think. And then I remembered. Are you sure? Oh, I'm sure, all right. Whoever he is, he's a lady killer. What do you mean? No offense. Uh, it was a sharp-looking dame down the end of the counter, and this guy breezes in and picks her up. Talks to her about 20 minutes, buys her a cup of coffee, and they walk out together. Do you remember what she looked like? Oh, nice-looking dame. Not beautiful, you know. More on the on the cute side. Ben, you got that morgue shot? Oh, Yeah. Here it is. Thanks. Here's a picture. This the girl? Let's see. Yeah, that's her. Who is she? I don't know, mister. Down at the morgue, they call her Jane Doe, number seven. Just by accident, we'd come across a concrete lead on the killer's method of operation. The picture we showed the man in the donut shop was a shot of the strangler's first victim the night before. Evidently, the killer would enter a bar, coffee shop, or restaurant, strike up a conversation with a woman, make friends with her, either buy her drinks or invite her to a bar in the neighborhood, and then the rest of the puzzle was still unsolved. We went back to the cottage cafe and checked with the men on stakeout. Not a sign of them, Chief. How are you men covering the place? Baxter up in front in the booth across from the cash register. Lyman's back with the dishwashers. I'm at the counter. When's Long due to report for work, Dave? At five. About... 20 minutes to go. You're lucky you're inside. It's wet out there. You're looking. All right, Davis. We'll be around about five. Right, Chief. Let's get back in the car. Where to, Skipper? Move the next two blocks, but don't go too far. If Long shows up for work this morning, we want to be around. The next ten minutes dragged by. The rain kept on. Backstrand chewed nervously on a cigar. At South Flower and First Street, the sewers were clogged with street refuse. The rain backed up and filled the intersection. A group of aircraft workers huddled together in the doorway on one corner, waiting for the bus. It was cold and damp. I opened one of the back windows in the car to get some fresh air in. Off in the distance and close by, we could hear the sounds of a big city waking up slow to a rainy January morning. It was eight minutes to five. Attention all units. Attention all units. At 780 East Main, a restaurant. Man answering description of murder suspect. All right, Romero, step on it. All right, Stephen. 
About ten blocks away, Ed. Who's going to cover the men at the cottage cafe? If this is a blind lead, it won't take us long to find out. They can handle it alone if they have to. Well, hang on. Look out. We're skidding. That was a close one, Ben. Yeah. If this is the guy, I owe you five bucks, right? Yeah. Additional information on your call to 780 East Main. Officers in pursuit of suspect. Suspect is on foot. Step on it, Romero. Two more blocks, Skipper. Watch us, Ben. Next one to the left. Got it. That's the joint up ahead there. All right, watch your step and don't take chances. Don't play with it. Right. Here we go. He went out the back, ran down that alley. Come on, Ben. Behind you. You men, hustle it. Circle around the block and choke off the alley. There. Emerson, boom. Go with the strike. Right over the fence, Ben. Ben, look out, look out. You all right? It's not that good. Come on, Jim. All right. All right, goes. Between the buildings. Stop or I'll shoot. The next house. He ducked into the basement. All right, cover me. All right. Come on, he broke through the garage doors. There's Davis. Dave, Dave, he slipped through. Get down to the next corner and ring the block. Yeah. Ben, Ben, did you follow him? Yeah, right on his tail, that warehouse, a couple of lots over. He went through the back. There it is, Joe. All right, don't go in blind. Watch out. All right, you, you haven't got a chance. Come out with your hands up. He's not stopping, Joe. All right, let's fan out. All right, Ben, cover me. I'm going for the door. All right, Ben, come on, you're clear. You spot him? There he is. Let's get him. Close. He's in a good spot. Let's move. He's up in the loft. Come on, let's head for the stairs. Will you? Easy. You spot him, Ben? No. Not a sign. Ben, look out, that packing tape! Close, man, Joe. Yeah. Let's get that punk now. Now, Joe, there's another one. All right, you. We got the warehouse surrounded. Come on down. All right, then we'll blast you out. Joe, he's dropping down the ladder. He's going for the front door. They're waiting for you with Tommy guns out there. They'll cut you down. Stop. Joe, he's got the door open. He's making a break for it. Crazy, he's trying to shoot his way out. Well, he asked for it. Yeah. Let's take a look. Messed up. Well, like his girlfriends. Yeah. Maybe he just didn't like women. Maybe. Hi, Ed. You all right? Tired. This is him, huh? Even the scratches that girl made on his face. <laughs> Description match? Five feet ten, 192 pounds, dark hair, dark eyes, age 29. Robert Long, killer. just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. You have just heard the tenth in a new series of authentic cases transcribed from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet is furnished by the Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Detective Louis A. Abbott of the Chicago Police Department who on the afternoon of March 3rd, 1947, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. If you enjoyed tonight's production of Dragnet, you'll probably want to listen this Saturday evening to a pair of adventure shows featuring two well-known Hollywood personalities. You'll enjoy Brian Donlevy, star of Dangerous Assignment. 
Also on Saturday's schedule is Richard Diamond, private detective, as played by the screen's romantic tough guy, Dick Powell. Listen to both of these exciting programs this Saturday over most of these NBC stations. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. My name's Jeff Regan. I get ten a day in expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Lyon. Anthony J. Lyon. I'm the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan, investigators stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of The Diamond Quartet. Well, this is the way it started. Melody called about 6 o'clock that night. She gave me the name of a restaurant out on the strip and said that Lion was waiting for me. I drove out there and found him squatting at one of the corner tables. He had a big white napkin tucked under all of his chins, and he was working on a plate of crab louis and a bottle of beer. A tall peroxide blonde in slacks and dark glasses was sitting across from him, watching him eat. And... Uh, a couple of bald-headed waiters were just sort of standing around looking at the ceiling. Well, well, Regan, I see you got my message. You're right on time. Sit down, sit down. I want you to meet Miss, um... What did you say your name was, young lady? Madge will do. Just plain Madge, fatso. Mm, uh, Regan, this is Madge. I hate gumshoes. They all stink. Okay, where'd you find her? Madge? Oh, um, Madge works for Mr. Daly, Mr. Pete Daly. He's a new client of ours. Isn't that right, uh, Madge? Oh, gumshoes are nosy. That's why I don't like them. Madge is going to drive you out to Mr. Daly's residence, Regan. Who's Daly? Very nice chap, very nice chap. I spoke with him on the phone. Hmm. What's the job? Well, it's a rather delicate matter, and I think Mr. Daly himself can explain it better than I. Come on, all this gas ain't getting us nowhere. The boss is waiting. Gumshoes talk too much. Uh, yes, Regan, yes. I told Mr. Daly you'd be there by 7 o'clock. You just run along with Madge here and see what it's all about. That's it. Uh, nice to have met you, Madge. Ah, dry up, Sato. Yeah, go on, go on. Um, uh, call me, Regan. Call me if you're running any trouble. Just plain Madge, who was carrying a twenty-five automatic in her purse. Well, we got into a Cadillac, we went out the pass, turned off a hill and back of Burbank. Daly's residence was at the end of a private road, a nice old southern-style place with two or three private patrolmen guarding the entrance. They all needed shade. They kind of nodded when we got out of the car and went up to the front door. Naturally, there was a peep shutter there. It was real southern. Yes? Yeah? Me, Felix. This is the private keeper the boss wants to see. Okay, me. Come on, this way. Who is it? Madge, I got your peeper. Inside. Here he is, Pete. Flat feet and all. His name's Regan. Okay, Madge, that's all. Beat it. Um, sit down, Regan, sit down. Don't mind Madge. She's kind of antisocial. Nice place you got. How's the gross? Yeah, I do all right. Two crab tables, two faro games, a little roulette in the living room, but I have to be careful. I noticed that driving up. There's lots of money thrown around here every night. Somebody might get some ideas. You know how it is. What about the law? Law? <laughs> no trouble with them. I just don't let them know I'm in operation. Mm -hmm. In my business, I haven't much use for private detectives. I don't generally like them. Neither does Madge. But I happen to need one right now. I want you to do a little job for me. You seem to have plenty of help around here. Wasn't that Felix Frazier at the door there? Last time I saw him, he was shadowing a banker up in Sacramento. Yes, that was Felix, all right, but uh, it's a little different. Now, never say this before. No? 
Well, it's a little bit of necklace called the Diamond Quartet. It's worth quite a chunk of cash. These four diamonds are good stuff. So? Dame named Annabella Callender left it here a week ago. She was in kind of deep at the roulette table and was wearing this. She left it for security. How much did she lose? About five Gs, I guess. Kind of screwy little dame. She's a widow with a lot of money and a boyfriend named Teddy Silco. He paints or something. They come here. And she loses steady. Every time. <laughs> well, she sent me a check today for the full amount of what she lost. Yeah? And uh, I want you to take this thing back to her tonight. That it? That's it. Now, I got my dough. She gets her little diamond necklace back. Just business. Well, it sounds simple. It's simple. You're a licensed investigator, bonded, and insured. Don't want any fuss about this. You just take it back. Very simple. Okay. Now, you told me how simple it all is. Suppose you give me the hook. Did her check bounce? You, uh, want a drink? There wasn't any check. I thought it'd be something like that. Yeah. She called me a couple hours ago, said if I didn't have this thing back by tonight, she'd call a load of cops and come out and get it. Not such a dumb dame as that. As you're telling me. <clears throat> if she comes here with cops, I'm closed for the season, and this dump cost me a pile of dough. Felix was running the roulette table that night. I didn't know he'd taken this as security until we counted up. I should have pushed his mush in or something, letting a dame like that make a setup. Well, maybe you'll do better next time. Ain't gonna be no next time, Reagan. Here's her address. Here's the ice. Just take it to her and I'll chalk it up to experience. You better get yourself a new boy at that table. Yes, you're telling me. You're telling me. Well, I took a taxi over to the restaurant in Hollywood, picked up my Buick and drove to an apartment house near Pico and Beverly Drive. A couple of men in a little gray coupe were sitting in front of the building smoking cigarettes and pulling on their hat brims. I figured Daly was making sure I got the right address. Upstairs on the fifth floor, I leaned into the buzzer and waited to see what Mrs. Annabella Callender looked like. Oh, Teddy, I thought you'd never get here. The performance begins at 8.15 and you know the traffic. Uh, oh, you aren't there. You Annabella Callender? Well, of course. Who are you? My name's Regan. Oh, Miss Regan. Well, I'm only waiting for Ted to get here so we can make first turn to the Biltmore. We're seeing Carousel and we're going to be late if he doesn't get here. You can understand that. Yeah, that figures. And I- I'm all ready and he hasn't shown up. Well, good night. Yeah, her white ermine cape and the black strapless thing needed a touch. But she had it. That necklace I had in my pocket, or a very good copy, was hanging around her neck, and it looked like four Klieg lights at a Hollywood premiere. Come on, come on. Hey, lay off, lay off, you busted door, lay off. What's the idea? You want to bust down the door? You drunk or something? I've been pounding on this door for five minutes. Well, that's too bad. Can't you read the signs? This building's close. The scram, drift, push off, blow. All right, you got a jeweler in this building named Tartaglia? Yeah, we got a jeweler named Tartaglia. Only don't want to see nobody because it's 9 o'clock at night. The joint's closing ain't here. All right, slow down. He lives someplace, don't he? Sure. There's a lot of houses that way. Why don't you try knocking on doors? There wasn't any residence listed in the phone book. I thought maybe if I came down here to his office, you could tell me where I might see him. I ain't going to tell you nothing. Look, I'm a private investigator. i got to see him tonight. Oh, uh... How's little old expense account, Pilgrim? It'll do. Let me see, pal. <coughs> the name's Freddie Leach. Your boy's a fat old pile of blubber with a lot of talk in this note. White Hotel, 208, three blocks, straight ahead. Thanks, Freddie. Anytime, pal. From the store, Buck, I'll tell you where his girlfriend lives. <laughs> Come in, Mr. Regan. Come in, come in. You find me a bit indisposed at this hour. I was preparing to retire, but you said it was a matter of jewelry. Therefore, Bert Tartaglia is at your service. Now, then, sir, what is so urgent? I came to see you about a diamond necklace. I found your name stamped on the inside. House of Tartaglia, most respected name in diamonds as in all the lapidary arts. Most respected. I'm the last of four sons. All... But... Continue, Mr. Regan. Take a look at this. And how do you come into possession of the Diamond Quartet, sir? A man named Daly, who runs a gambling club, hired me to take it back to a lady named Callender. Gambling house? And how did Mr. Daly acquire it? Well, she lost it at a roulette table. She left it so she could raise the cash. Deplorable, deplorable conduct on her part. Annabella Callender, 
A very indiscreet young lady, to be sure, to be sure. Lovely body propelled by a ridiculous man. I tried to take it back to her tonight. It's beautiful. Isn't it, Mr. Regan? I want to know if it's real or not. Real? Of course it's real. You sure? Mr. Regan, do you doubt my ability as a gemologist? Once in a lifetime, sir, only once in a lifetime, does an artisan have the opportunity to create the perfect necklace. How much will it pull? Priceless in the amount of work. Roughly $65,000. See, here, under the light. See how carefully each stone is mounted. Without reservation, I pronounce the diamond quartet an incomparable masterpiece. Well, I saw one just like it tonight. Well, I didn't quite follow you, sir. No one could create another diamond quartet except Bert Tartaglia. Well, and somebody made up a pretty good imitation. <laughs> the finest workman at best would create only a crude resemblance. This kind of work demands an artist, Mr. Regan, an artist. But it could get by. Well, uh, to the unpracticed eye, ah, yes. To the layman, perhaps, yes. Mm-hmm. That's all I wanted to know. Later to Nanguas Herba, eh? What was that? Latin. A snake in the grass, eh? Maybe. Your expression tells me you are concerned for the safety of this piece. I have a safe here in my room, if you care. No, it'll be all right. Well, then, you leave satisfied, I trust. Yeah, thanks. Think nothing of it, Mr. Egan. Think nothing of it. Just remember the house of Tartaglia when you want fine jewels. Good evening, sir. <laughs> In the lobby, I got two three-cent stamps from the clerk. He watched me put the diamond quartet in an envelope, address it to myself, and mail it right there. He blinked a couple of times, but I didn't tell him about my two pals parked across the street in the little gray coop. Well, they were sitting there, still sucking on cigarettes and pulling on their hat brims. When I walked outside, they got out of the coop, came over to where I was lighting a cigarette. The tall one tapped me on the shoulder. Here's the paper, Georgie. Want to ask him for a match? Georgie's near sighted. That's too bad. That's him, Danny. Got a match, Peeper? Georgie asked if you got a match, Peeper. He's a dummy, Georgie. He don't talk. Got a match, Peeper? What I tell you, he's a dummy. He don't look like no dummy. Why, he's a dummy, all right, ain't you, Peeper? See, he's a dummy, Georgie. I told him about you being near side, and he said it was too bad. Didn't you, Peeper? He still don't talk. Go on, Peeper. Tell Georgie how sorry you are about him being near sighted. I told you he was a... I told you he was a dummy, Georgie. I'll privatize like you. Georgie asked you a question. He wants to know if all privatized is like you. Danny boy says you're a dummy. You're a dummy? Georgie asked you another question. He wants to know if you're a dummy. See, he don't answer. I don't like dummies. We asked three questions already and he ain't said nothing. That makes him a dummy. Maybe we'd find something if we went through the dummy's pockets. Yeah, even a dummy's got pockets. Ain't that right, dummy? Hold it, Georgie. <laughs> Hey, move just like a dummy. What do you want? Hey, talk. Yeah, yeah, make him talk again, Georgie. Oh. Make him talk bigger, Georgie. Oh. Talk's real nice, but he don't say much. Maybe he's tough, Georgie. He might think he's tough. But then again... Oh. You see? Yeah, it's a tough. Now it's my turn. <laughs> hey. You don't talk no more, Danny. This peeper ain't no pretty picture, Georgie. Why you want to hold him up? You are listening to the story of the Diamond Quartet. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Twenty-nine thousand nurses are needed now to join the new Army Nurse Corps Officers Reserve. For the first time in history, qualified nurses are given the opportunity of receiving a commission in the regular Army Reserve. These nurses will remain on inactive status, ready to serve their country in the event of an emergency. Four thousand of them, if they wish, may choose active duty. Inactive reserve status will not interfere with the nurse's civilian life, but the educational opportunities offered her by the Army Medical Department will be of a great advantage to her in her work. So don't wait. If you're a registered graduate nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, drop a card now for complete information to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now, back to the story of the Diamond Quartet and Jeff Regan, Investigator. <laughs> Can you hear me, Regan? Nurse, are you sure he's coming too? 
He had quite a beating, Mr. Lyon. He's coming around. Reagan, Reagan. Reagan. Reagan, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Reagan, can you hear me? I think he's with us now. Hmm. It's me, Regan. What happened to you? I didn't you call. Regan, do you understand me? Hmm? What's this? That's your head. And it isn't very pretty, let me tell you that. I'll be at my desk, Mr. Lyon. Oh, all right. Come on, give it to me. What happened? An hour ago, the receiving hospital telephones me that they picked you up in some gutter. I come down to see what's what, and you lay there and ask me what's this. Well, it's a wrong job. Another punk client. As long as they've got the dough, we love them all. Who are you fighting with? A couple of boys named Danny and Georgie. Mm, a couple of boys named Danny and Georgie. Mm. Well, would you mind telling me just where you've been while you should have been doing what you were hired to do? I was out with Danny and Georgie. Sure. You were out with Danny and Georgie. But what did you do before that? And what did you do with the necklace? That diamond quartet or whatever it is. I mailed it. You mailed it? You were hired to deliver that thing personally, and you mail it. Where's my clothes? Regan, I'll never understand you. I'll never understand you or the way you do things. I send you out on a simple little job. All you have to do is take a necklace back, and what do you do? You wind up bleeding all over the city streets. Here's your pants. What time you got? Three o'clock in the morning. It's always three o'clock in the morning when somebody telephones me that you're in trouble somewhere. Well, why don't you go home and go back to bed? I haven't been to bed. I haven't had one wink of sleep tonight. You know why? Because on top of all my other troubles, some dame who sounds like she has a suit full of hoops has been calling my place every half hour asking for you. My place. Why didn't you tell her to call my place? I did tell her to call your place. I told her a couple of hundred times to call your place. Then I told her to shut up. Coach. Here. Uh, you look terrible. Terrible. She give you a name? Oh, Annabella something or other. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I want to know is... Uh, hey, where are you going? Who's going to pay this hospital bill? What are you... Where are you going? Well, the cab driver circled twice before he picked me up, but he got me out to her place in 20 minutes. When I got upstairs, her door was halfway open, and the light from the hallway kind of seeped in. She was... Sitting in a big chair right by the door. I don't know why, but she was holding the phone on her lap. Just sitting there, looking at nothing. Oh, Mr. Reagan. It's you. You came back. Yeah. I don't think you're going to need this. Oh. Well then, Mr. Reagan. Well then. I suppose you've met some people tonight who know a great deal about me. Some? A gambler, a jeweler. And of course they told you how I carry on with money and all that. Everyone seems to know that. Yeah, Bailey told me. Do you know about Charles? Charles and I had so many things together, and it was so much fun being alive with him. You like to have fun, Mr. Regan? I I do think he enjoyed being alive with me. I mean, I, I, I cried when Charles was killed. I really did. I cried. I, I didn't know what to do. I cried. How long ago was that? Oh, Charles was killed three years ago. But now I have Teddy. He's really a dear. You should meet him. We should all have a drink together or something. Teddy's a fine artist. Very fine artist. I, I think you'll be very prominent someday. I, I do. I, I really do think Teddy will be very prominent. Some day. Of course, it wouldn't make any difference now. Did they tell you that I... 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 I did they tell you... It's funny. I can't seem to get my tongue adjusted to my mouth. Has that ever happened to you, Mr. Regan? Sometimes. Eddie asked me to marry him tonight. He did? Yes, I... 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 I, I, I I've been very lonely since Charles died, and... This is my money that Teddy's interested in, I'm, I'm certain. Teddy has some money of his own, although many people don't know it. <clears throat> what is money, Mr. Regan? What would you say, Mama? <laughs> money. Oh, dear, sir. I go again with that business about my tongue. <laughs> you think I should see a correction? Why did you call me tonight? You're the only detective I know. And I, I really don't know you. 
It's just that Mr. Daly said you were a detective. Why did you want to see me? I really can't understand money. I know it must sound strange to you, but... <laughs> some people live for it, and... and some people die for it, and... and some people... <laughs> uh, what's wrong? What is it? Come on. Oh, they do look so funny. So very funny. I've seen them count money. Oh, so much money, and I, I really believe that's all they live for. <laughs> They handle it and caress it now. <laughs> Come on, tell me what's wrong. What is it? What is it? <laughs> she was pointing to a black spot across the room. I found the light switch and turned it on. Oh, yeah. They looked funny, all right. It was Daly and his dumb roulette table man, Felix. And both of them were as dead as you can get. <laughs> Your name's Silco? Oh, 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 yes, I was expecting... My name's Regan. I'm a private investigator. I'm calling from her apartment. Annabella? So now, you... listen. There's been a couple of murders here. What? She's had quite a jolt. She's going to need you and all the help she can get. I called homicide and... Well, it might be kind of rough for her. I'll bring a doctor. And a lawyer. I've got a good one. I'll be there in ten minutes. Thank you. Well, he showed up about the same time when Daddy and the homicide boys got there. By that time... She couldn't even talk, and they had to put her to sleep. I told Wendetti what I knew about it, and he said we'd get it straightened around as soon as it, she had something to say. It was about 8 o'clock in the morning when I got home. I didn't expect my boy to show up so soon. He was already there. Ah, uh, Regan. I've been expecting you. Come in, sir. Come in. I've been amusing myself with your chessboard. So we meet again. Sit down, sit down. You've had rather a hectic night, I'll wager. Your boys were pretty rough. Georgie and Danny. Uh, two men of another world, Regan. Not our world. Allow me to apologize for their actions. And so unnecessary, too. I underestimated you, Regan. Such an ingenious method of protecting the diamond quartet. Why, sir, by the simple expedient of placing a three-cent stamp on an envelope and mailing it to you yourself, you were hired as guardians the entire United States Postal Service. Not to mention the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps. You want one of these? No, thank you, Regan. Much too early in the day. But, uh, go ahead. You give me cause to admire you again, sir. I'm one of those faint-hearted persons who cannot abide liquor until five o'clock in the afternoon. All right. What happens now? By God, I admire your directness, Mr. Regan. When I met you last night, I promised myself you'd give me trouble, and you have. Who's in on it? Such directness. In answer, sir, that is a matter to be explained. Double cross. If you can bear my vanity, I have invented a new word. Triple cross. It does have a ring to it, doesn't it? Sounds familiar. <laughs> my God, sir, I like yours. Daily in on this? Daily? No, 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 of course not. A mere instigator. But when Madge explained to me that he was returning the diamond to Quartet, I first conceived the plan. Just plain Madge. She and her friends have been very valuable to me. They knocked off Daly and Felix and planted them in the girl's apartment. Right. With two cadavers in her living room, Mrs. Callender was very unlikely to discuss missing jewelry with the police. Then it was a phony she was wearing and she didn't even know it, huh? <clears throat> then it caused all of this. <laughs> if you had merely returned it, it would have been simple to remove it from her. <laughs> but then... And you just sit here and wait for the mail. We wait for the mail, Mr. Regan. What about your playmates? <laughs> you do act your role, don't you? And I like you for it, Mr. Regan. I wish you and I could have worked out something together. An unbeatable team. In answer, sir, I'm afraid I should be sought for murder for two this night. Danny and Georgie? And, uh, Madge. Does that name bother you as much as it bothers me? Give me a woman with a name like Celeste or... Josephine or Roxanne. Those are our proper names for the creatures. But Madge. 
Where are the police going to find all these bodies? In my hotel room, which I departed hastily. I know a man down at Central Homicide named Wendetti. Do you? Mm-hmm. He's the best cop I've ever seen. You'll never get away with it. Allow me to correct you, sir. I don't intend to get away with it. Observe me well. You see before you a man advanced in years, attached to a destitute and bankrupt jewelry firm with nothing more to look forward to than a grim few years and finally the end. Now, an opportunity to live like a king, and by cancer, I've taken it. They'll pick you up before you can pack a bag. <laughs> I'll risk that. I shall turn the diamond quartet into cash, and with a well-laden purse, I shall be satisfied to elude the police over half the world. Oh, yes, they'll get me. In two years, three years, perhaps. By that time, I shall have spent the money. And what more could a man ask than a perfect fulfillment of all his wishes? Huh? I ask you, sir, as one gentleman to another, what more could a man ask? You have company, and I have a gun. Answer it. Tell him to go away. I'll be right beside you. All right. Open it. One side, Thomas. I got a gun. Had you. Thought I'd find you here, plop boy. Get him music to good. Yeah, on, Caution, my dear. I have a gun, too. I can last long enough to let you have it. Get out of my way, people. Oh. Uh, Mr. Regan. Mr. Regan, sir. I believe I, I've been shot. I need a better assistant. I can't seem to hold my feet, sir. Oh, I'll hold my feet. The motor is near Missy Bonham, Mr. Regan. Or, if your second year Latin escapes you, speak well of the dead. It was an awkward plan at best. It was a lousy idea. Well, there wasn't anybody left for Wendetti to arrest, so we sat around and looked at each other. Wendetti agreed that Mads double-crossed Daly, Tartaglia double-crossed Mads and her boys. Yeah, triple-crossed. Well, the lion had something on his mind. He wanted to know, was I satisfied with what I got out of this case? I didn't answer him. I need the job. The Army Nurse Corps Reserve still has commissions available. If you are a graduate registered nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, you may be eligible for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps section of the regular officer's reserve. Graduate work is provided at the Army's most modern teaching center, and the nurses obtain educational experiences that benefit them in both civilian and military nursing. If you believe you qualify for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve, apply to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. <laughs> Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan, with Wilms Herbert as Anthony J. Lyon. The role of Bert Tartaglia was played by Barry Kroger. Lorene Tuttle was Annabella Callender. It's CBS same time next week for Trouble, Suspense, and Thrilling Adventure with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Written by E. Jack Newman, produced by Gordon T. Hughes, directed tonight by Cliff Howell. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Here is another in NBC's great parade of new shows. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. 
Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to burglary detail. A sudden wave of jewel thefts is sweeping the city. In 16 days, 16 burglaries have been committed, one each night. They bear the same trademark. Thousands of dollars of jewels are missing. The thief is a master at his trade. Your job, get him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, June 17th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of burglary. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way into work that morning, and it was 7.53 a.m. when I got to room 45. Burglary detail. Hi, Joe. How are you, Walker? Going to be a scorcher out today. Yeah, just like yesterday. Ben in yet? I think he's over in communications picking up the mail. Mm, thanks. You guys been busy? Yeah, kind of. Jewel thefts. Anything big? No, no big hauls, but he's consistent. Sixteen nights in a row. Hmm. Same guy? think so. Same M.O. Yeah, everybody's got troubles. Got to check some records. See you later, Joe. Okay, Willie. Burglary Friday. Yeah. Okay, Mike, soon as Ben gets back. He's picking up the mail. Right. Bye. Hi, Joe. Hi, Ben. Hannon just called. Chief wants to see us. Take a look at these first. What do you got, overnight reports? Yeah, yeah, these two. Mm. Yeah. Two of them. Three diamond rings, one sapphire, one necklace, jade. Big haul. Look at the other one. Ladies' watch, diamond band, emerald bracelet, tourmaline brooch. What's tourmaline, Ben? I don't know. It must be valuable. It's gone. Uh-huh. Let's see. Owner left house about 9 p.m., returned about 1.30 a.m., found property gone, scratches on the door. Probably using the cellophane method. Hasn't missed yet. Two in one night. Well, he's picking up his pace. Must have a bag full of loot somewhere, whoever it is. You get the description sheet from pawn shop detail? Yeah, I got them right here. You take half of them. Let's see what luck we got this morning. Yeah, uh-huh. mm. Nothing so far. Mm-mm. Me neither. Let's see. I'll get it, Joe. Burglar Romero. Hi, Ben. Chief still wants to talk to you, boys. He's got an appointment at 8.30. He wants to see you before he leaves. Okay, Mike. Just checking some buy sheets. Be right in. Better make it fast. He's in a bad mood this morning. Okay, Mike. Thank you. Back strand again? Yeah, he's in a bad mood. Come on. Wonder what's bothering him. Something's bad. He doesn't blow very often. Chief of Detectives Office, Hannon. Go ahead in, boys. He's waiting. Thank you, Mike. All right, ma'am. I'll connect you. Freddy, Romero, sit down. Wait till I get the phone. Back strand. Oh, yes, Mrs. Winthrop. Yes, ma'am. We're doing all we can. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I'll do that. Yes, ma'am. Goodbye. Got trouble, Ed? Taxpayer, Mrs. Winthrop. You two ought to remember the name. We do, Skip. Ten days ago, somebody lifted $2,000 worth of diamonds from her bedroom while she was at the symphony. Last night, she was hit again. A diamond watch, an emerald bracelet, and some kind of a brooch. Tourmaline. I don't care what kind it was, it's gone. What's the pitch? We just read a report a couple of minutes ago, Skipper. Could be a time with those other 16 jobs. 16 jobs in 16 days. You haven't got a lead on the thief yet? Nothing shows up. No prints, nothing. Uh, what about the pawn shops? Nobody's tried to soak any hot stuff as far as we know. We double-checked the detail. We got every hawk shop in town on the alert. Whoever it is, they've got to try to pawn the stuff sometime. Unless they're going to give diamond rings for Christmas presents. And they haven't tried the pawn shops yet, Skipper. We sure they. Look, 16 burglaries in 16 days. Jewels and watches. Good ones. Well, it's got to stop. It's got to stop soon, you understand? We'll stay right on top of it, Ed. We're doing all we can. For two weeks, I've had half a dozen women calling me every day. Society women. Some of them figure they should get extra treatment. They're only DR numbers to us, Skipper. They all get the same attention. I'll try and explain that to some of them. They think you're in on the racket. Maybe you boys would like to take these calls some morning. No, thanks, Ed. All right, then. Let's get some action. 
Keep the pawn shop operators on their toes and get after every known fence in town. That's all. I've got an appointment. All right, Ed. Check you later. Holding a call for you, Ben. Oh, thank you. Hello. Oh, hi, Max. What? What? Well, hold it. Be right down. First break, Joe. What do you got? Necklace and a watch. Both of them on the stolen property list. Where? Henry's Pawn Shop. Fifth and Main. Six minutes later, at 8.25 a.m., Ben and I drove up in front of Henry's Square Deal Pawn Shop. Quick cash. No red tape. Watches bought and sold. The proprietor was Max Murphy, an old friend of Ben's. Well, pal, of all days, it had to happen yesterday. Took the day off and went fishing up at Big Bear. I left my nephew in charge, Harry. A real knothead, that kid. How do you mean, Max? Joe, if I told him once, I told him a hundred and once. Whatever you do, whatever they come in with the hawk, check it with the list. Check it with the stolen property list. What does he do? He forgot. He forgot. Oh, a real knothead, that boy. How old is he, Max? Thirty-two. A real knothead. I checked the slips from yesterday. Then I checked the stolen property list. There it is. Hot stuff. When does stuff come in, Max? Do you know? About four o'clock yesterday afternoon. Can we look at it? Oh, sure. Yeah, it's back here behind the car. There it is. Did you check out the serial numbers on the watch yet, Max? When I found out, yes. They match to a T. All right, let's see. Yeah. Description on this necklace matches, too. Let's have a look at your buy book, huh, Max? Yes, sir, Joe. Here you are. There's a deal right there. Here? Yeah, that's him. That's how he gave his name. Uh, Walter Tracy, 132 and a half Blackstone Court, Los Angeles. Let me check the book for the description, man. Oh, sure. Yeah, uh, here. Mm-hmm. Okay, Max, thanks. We'll be checking with you later. Sure, Joe. Anytime. Sorry. All right, Max. See you later. Uh, you fellas take it easy. Right. I want to check and see if we're clear, Joe? Yeah, I will. 80K to Control 1. 80K to Control 1. Are we clear? Control 1 to 80K. Stand by. Good lead, Joe. Got a description in here. Yeah. It's too bad Max's nephew had to slip up. Control 1 to 80K. Call your office immediately. Call your office immediately. KMH. Wonder what that's about. I don't know. I'll call in. You got some change? I'll use Max's phone. Use your phone a minute, Max. Oh, you, Ben? Sure, help yourself. Thank you. City Hall. Two five two four. Two five two four. Burglary, Levine. This is Ben, George. You got something? Hot one. Universal loan shop, sixth and Barton place. Guy just took in a couple of rings. He checked too late. What you mean? He checked the form after the guy left. It was signed Walter Tracy. There they are, Sergeant. Both rings. Fine quality diamonds. Don't you usually check your stolen goods list before you take in stuff like this? Usually, yes. Last night, no. I don't know what I was thinking about. Can we have a look at your buy book? Right here. There it is. Walter Tracy. 699 Olive Street. 145 pounds, 5 foot 9, dark hair, build, thin. We'll have to slap a hold on these rings. I know. I should have thought. Can you think of anything else that might help us to identify the man? Well, no. Had a light suit on. Nice cut. Very well dressed. Thank you. That's all for now. Here's a card. If the guy happens to drop back, give us a call, will you? Sure will, Sergeant. Say. Yeah? I've got some nice watch pens. Yours look gold. Can I interest you? No, thanks. Some other time. Come on, Ben. That afternoon and the following morning, despite our alert and our warnings, two more pawn shops called in with reports of stolen watches taken in. We checked them out. The serial numbers on the watches match those on the stolen property list. On the pawn shop account books, the loan was listed under the name Walter Tracy. The addresses were given as number 12 St. Vincent Place and 700 East Flower. The descriptions of the man were the same. Slight build, well-dressed, about 145 pounds, 5 feet 9 inches tall, dark wavy hair. We had the name and description distributed to every pawn shop in Los Angeles and surrounding communities. Through our informants, we checked up on every known fence in the city. 
For the next two nights, we received no reports of stolen jewels. That made up for the double burglary the night before. On June 19th, the box score read, 18 successive nights, 18 successive jewel burglaries. At 3.25 in the afternoon, Ben and I sat down to check over the late incoming reports. Got anything, Joe? Oh, not yet, no. Mm, nothing here. Maybe the guys left town. Nope. No such luck. Take a look. That's it, number 19. He may set a record. Oh, he's making monkeys out of us, isn't he? Look, man's watch, lady's watch, Chinese amber necklace, diamond shirt studs, and a bracelet with two large rubies. He's getting ambitious. How's the value listing? Let's see. Eighteen hundred dollars. One haul. I'll get it. Burglary Friday. Yeah. What? Yeah. Be right down. Stall him. Let's go, Ben. Where? Kaplan's down on East 2nd. Walter Tracy's in there now, trying to hock a gold watch. Ben, cover the door. I'll go and look like I'm shopping around. Right, but watch your step. We don't know this guy. Yeah, stay close to the door, huh? I'm sorry. That's the best we can do on the watch. Look, Mac, this is gold. 21 jewels. Well, that's the best I can do. Ah, drop dead. Well, it's the best I can do. Don't get sore. Yeah, sure. See you later. That's him, Sergeant. Wallet Tracy. I stole him as long as I could. All right, I'll check back with you later. Did you spot the guy that just came out? Yeah, I went up the street. Let's follow him. Hustle it. You spot him, Ben? Straight ahead, about 15 yards. He's crossing the street. Yeah, let's get up a little closer. We're losing sure if the light changes. Come on, run for it. Watch the traffic light. Yeah. That was close. You might have spotted us. He's going faster. Come on, Joe, run. Yeah. Don't lose him. This crowd's not helping. Hey, hey, wait a minute. I bet you're a cop. You're chasing somebody. All right, let go of my arm, mister. Let go. Well, you don't have to get tough. Lousy cops take the owner street. I'm going to write the mayor's off. Come on, Joe. He's running for him. Yeah, I see him. Watch the signal up ahead. Hurry, Joe. Almost up to him. Into the parking lot. Hey, you! Stop! Look out, Joe. A gun! Yeah, I see. All right. Get away. All Get right. away, smart guy. <laughs> Nice job. Yeah. He's too fast for an honest man. Let's take him in. When we got back to headquarters, Walter Tracy was under technical arrest. We took him directly to the interrogation room. We searched him thoroughly. We had him take everything out of his pockets and put it on the table. Then we had him take all the money he had in his wallet, count it out, and hold it in his hand. What is all this routine? That's all the money you have on you? $47.17, $47.17, right? Yeah. Okay, keep it in your hand. Ben, shake him down. All right, Tracy, take off your coat, shirt, tie, and your shoes and stuff. What kind of a pitch is this? I'm no hood. Take them off. Two big cops. You're not pinning anything on me. I don't care what you do. Sleeves, pockets, lining. Nothing in the coat, Joe. Get his shirt. Take it light with the threads, huh? Costs money. How about the trousers, Ben? Let me see. Cuffs, pockets. No. Let me get the belt. Zipper on the inside of the belt? No, it's clean. Shoes are okay. All right, Tracy, let's see the soles of your feet. I hope you don't mind. Uh, they're dirty. Why don't you take a shower? Let's see. All right, Joe, nothing. Put your toes back on. Yeah, thanks. All right, Joe, what's your name? Huh? I said, what's your name? You telling jokes? Walter Tracy, you know that. Your real name. How old are you, Tracy? Twenty-seven. Where do you live? No place. Just got in town a couple of days ago. Where are you from? Salina, Kansas. Where you been sleeping the last two nights? The park, Pershing Square. Clothes don't show it. Pretty natty. I had him pressed. Where? Down by the square. I don't remember. You ever been arrested before? No. Where'd you get this gun, Tracy, the one you pulled on us? I didn't know who you were. Could have been a couple of hoods. <laughs> you kind of look like it. Where'd you get the gun? I won it in a crap game, coming out on the train. Where'd you get the watch? Graduation present. You want to run a make on him, Joe? The gun and the watch? Yeah, I'll call him. Go on, check. You can't prove a thing. Pawn shop records, Gilmore. Gil, this is Friday. Can you give me a make on a watch? Sure, Joe, go ahead. Time master, yellow gold, man's wristwatch. Case number 
716F23. Right. Movement number B351708. Got it. Okay. Now give me a make on this gun, huh? 32 S&W automatic. Serial number 579461. Okay. Call me back. Right. What's your station number? 2572. I'll ring you, Joe. Thanks. Having fun? What'd you do with all those jewels you stole? When do I get out of here? I don't think you're going to get out. You got nothing on me. How tall are you, Tracy? Get your tape measure. Five, nine. How much you weigh? 140. I'm 27. My name's Walter Tracy. I come from Salina. I've been in town two days, and I don't know what you guys are talking about. You sound smart. You don't act it. And you're flying blind, copper. What'd you do with those jewels you stole? I don't know what you're talking about. What color are your eyes? I don't know. I'm colorblind. What color would you say your hair is? You colorblind, too? You ever been arrested before? Straighten out. He asked me that. I'm asking you. No. You ever done any big time? No. All right, I don't care if you're level with us or not. We're going to make you on those prowl jobs, all 19 of them. Sure, sure. You guys are smart. You got in Los Angeles two days ago, is that right? Yeah. You don't know anything about any jewel thefts? That's what I said. And how come your name and your handwriting's on the account books in four pawn shops in Los Angeles? It's not mine. You can't prove it. We can, Tracy. Come clean. What'd you do with the stuff you stole from 1250 Moraga Drive, June 5th? I didn't steal any stuff. What'd you do with the rings and watches you took from 1400 Placerville Road, June 9th? I wasn't in town. What'd you do with the diamond dress pins you stole June 13th, 123 South Van Ness? Did I do that? You're not only kinky, you're a bad liar. You prove it. Porter, get you a saw buck, your prints bounce, Tracy. Our handwriting man's gone to work on those signatures of yours. You haven't got a chance. Now, come on. Where'd you hide this stuff? You can't prove a thing. Where'd you say you've been sleeping the last two nights? In the park, Pershing Square. You want a map? Clothes sure look nice. I said I had them pressed. But you can't remember where. No, I can't remember where. That a crime? Friday something. Joe, this is Gilmore. Here's the stuff you asked for. Let's have it, Joe. No make on the watch, no make on the gun. Okay, Joe, thanks a lot. Yeah. You're in up your neck. You said that, didn't you? You're going to talk, Tracy. Kind of tired. All right, we'll let you sleep on it. Come on, Ben, let's book him. Right. I'll get your jobs, coppers. Sure. Come on. We took Walter Tracy to the county jail and had him booked on suspicion of burglary. He was still sullen. We knew we had the guilty man. Now we had to prove it. As it often happens, the victims never see the burglar. They only know he's been there. They can't identify him, but they can identify their property. Our job was to find the property. When we did, we'd have Walter Tracy. And the 19 victims would have their property returned. But Tracy wasn't talking. We knew he'd never talk unless he thought it might help him. We took the problem to Ed Backstrand. Smart punk, Skiffer, but he's done time before. How do you know? Tried him out last night when we brought him in. He talks like it and he acts like it. But he won't cop out. Are you sure? He won't talk in a hundred years. He knows he's got us in the spot. And one thing's sure. We're not going to send him up without finding the loot first. He's planted the stuff somewhere in this city. We've got to find it. Ben and I have got an idea, Ed. It's not going to be easy, but it might work. When is it? Tracy tried to soak some of the stolen property at four separate pawn shops in the downtown area. Yeah? At each one of those four pawn shops, he gave a local address. Now, we're sure he must have a room or an apartment someplace in town. All right. Where? That's where guesswork comes in, Skipper. Every one of those addresses he gave falls within a certain area. How big an area? Oh, uh, you've got that street diagram, Joe? Yeah. Here it is, Ed. From uh, Figueroa here to San Pedro. And from... Uh, Pico, down to 1st Street. The area's about 12 blocks wide, 14 blocks long. Mm, that's a lot of territory. How are you going to cover it? On foot. We'll take Tracy with us. Plenty of legwork. You sure it's the answer? We've got to find the stuff, and it's the only way we can figure it. Hotels, apartments, rooming houses. There must be hundreds of places he could stay in that territory. It'll take a couple of weeks. Yeah, on foot it will. All right. It's tough, but it's your idea. Go to it. An hour after we left Chief Backstrand, we got Tracy out of his cell in the county jail and started our canvas of the appointed area. We took the usual precautions and handcuffed Tracy's wrists to our own. We started the search for his hideout at First Street in Figueroa. It was a warm day in Los Angeles. The temperature was 91. After the first three hours, I could tell Ben's feet were ready to give out, and so were mine. We couldn't even have the comfort of complaining. That had encouraged Tracy, and he was cocky enough already. He cursed and threatened every step of the way. My legs off. All right, quit pulling, will you? 
Come on, Tracy, up the stairs. Another one to check. Warm day, Joe. Yeah, a little. What do you mean, a little? Must be 110. Yes? What is it? Are you the manager? Yes. Could you tell me which apartment this man has in your house, ma'am? Who, him? Yes, ma'am, this one. Never saw him before. He don't live here. All right, ma'am, thank you. Yeah. Hot, ain't it? <laughs> when are you going to get wise? Come on, Tracy. Well, that finishes this side of the street. You want to cross over, Joe? Yeah, let's go. I'm hungry. I want to eat. After we cover the other side of the street. You can't do this to me. I'm going to get a lawyer out of your jobs, both of you. Yeah, uh-huh. come on. We only got a couple of hundred places to go. Hi, gents. What can I do for you? You the manager? I run the place, yeah. Which room does this man have in your place? Him? You made a mistake. He doesn't live here. All right, thanks. My feet are killing me. Wait till I get a lawyer. I'll burn both of you, dumb cops. What do you think you're doing anyway? All that day and the day after that and the day after that, Ben and I, with Tracy handcuffed to our wrist, canvassed the designated areas from hotel to hotel, from rooming house to rooming house, and the apartments, too. Every day, our feet ached a little more, our pace slowed down, Tracy got more irritable, and the weather got hotter. The second day, it reached a high of 92. The third day, 94. The fourth day, 94. Police regulations say plain clothes officers must wear a coat and necktie on the street at all times. We wore our coats and neckties. The search continued into the fifth day. Our pace got even slower. Ben and I started to lose heart. After a while, we forgot our object was to recover the stolen jewels. All we wanted was to find Tracy's hideout. We knew we were right. We knew Tracy was our man. It was a point of pride. Whether your feet hurt or not, you don't give in to a thief. Yes? What do you want? You're the landlady here. I am. Which apartment does this man have in the building? Well, none of them. He's not one of my tenants. Thank you, ma'am. Come on, Tracy. By the sixth day, all three of us had special pads in our shoes. Our feet ached worse than ever. Tracy let us know about his every three minutes. By late afternoon of the sixth day, we'd covered more than half of the designated area. The temperature was 95. You guys gonna go on forever? I'm sweating like a horse. I'm getting tired of your moaning. That looks like the manager behind the desk. Yes, sir? You the manager? Yes, sir. What can I do for you? Can you tell us which room this man has in the hotel? Him? Mm -hmm. He doesn't live here. Hey, uh, you fellas look awfully warm. Like to cool off in the lobby? We're air-conditioned. No, thanks. I'm hungry. When do we eat? You're always hungry. You got the biggest mouth on a cop I ever saw. Oh, All yeah. right, then. Uh, yeah. I'm hungry. I want to eat. Now. Wait till I give this story to the papers. Mistreating innocent guys. They'll break you. All right. Come on. Up the stairs. I'm going to get a lawyer tonight. I'll show you. Yes? Why, Mr. Baker, where have you been? <laughs> We questioned the landlady, a Miss Elizabeth Hunter. She told us that Baker, alias Tracy, had rented an apartment from her about two months before. That's all the information she could give us. Tracy clammed up. He would admit nothing. We asked Miss Hunter to accompany us as a witness. We took the elevator up to Tracy's apartment on the sixth floor. Miss Hunter, Tracy, Ben, and I. Down this way. Here. Do you want me to open it? Please, Miss Hunter. There's a girl. Walter? What is Walter? I told you to get out of town if I didn't come back. I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to leave without you. I thought you slept in the park. Ah, take a jump. Where's the stuff hidden? All right, Ben. Handcuff him to a chair. The girl behind him. We'll find the stuff ourselves. All right, Tracy. All right, you, Nick. I haven't done anything either. See, you can't prove it. Billy, shut up. That's better. No talking between you two. Fears will separate you. All right, Ben, you take the living room here. I'll try the kitchen and get a window open. It's hot in here. All right. Sergeant, you will be careful of the furniture. Yes, ma'am. Well, I had no idea. You, Mr. Baker, of all people. Don't talk to him, please, ma'am. Oh, yes. 
tin cup. Why don't you spill? Ben, look. It's only the beginning. He's got the stuff scattered seven ways for Sunday. We're going to need help. In the milk bottle? Yeah, two rings, three loose diamonds, and this bottle of mayonnaise. We found some kind of a brooch in it. A couple of watches taped to the underside of the kitchen sink. All right, you. Convinced? Okay, Ben. Call Backstrand. There was a definite possibility that Walter Baker, alias Tracy, had stored some of his stolen loot outside his apartment. We stood little chance of ever recovering it unless we got him to break. Ben called Chief Backstrand, and in ten minutes he arrived at the apartment with another man from burglary detail, George Levine. Together we went over the four-room apartment foot by foot. We found jewelry, watches, loose stones in every conceivable place. In cartons of cottage cheese, in jars of cold cream, in the garbage can, everywhere. Who's your girlfriend? All right, I'll ask her. What's your name? I said, what is your name? Billy. Billy Crawford, he didn't do anything. He didn't. All right, Billy. Maybe you can tell us. Where's the rest of the stuff he stole? He didn't steal. He didn't steal anything. Billy, shut up. Keep quiet, you. Ed, wait a minute. What? Just a minute. I want to look over here. Papers. Taped to the underside of that top drawer. What is it, Frank? No, no, you can't. You can't. Look at these. All right. You found them. I'll talk. No, Walter, don't. Parole all papers. He's an ex-con. Yeah, I'll cop out. Don't do it, Walter. Billy, shut up. Dumb dame. The rest of the stuff, where is it? On the roof. Inside the ventilator, the one near the front, you'll find a couple of paper bags. That's it. Levine? Got it, Chief. I'll check it. Your papers say you did time in Oregon. What for? Fell for robbery. Did five. I owe him seven. What about the girl? Walter, I'm going with you. Her? I don't know. You figure it. All right, Friday. Romero, take the girl to Lincoln Heights and book her. We'll take him. Right, Ed. Come on, Ben. No. No, Walter, I want to go with you. I'm sorry, ma'am. This way out. All right, easy, lady. No, no, wait a minute. Just a minute. Walter. You're a dumb dame, Billy. So long. Walter. All right, come on. Let's go. What's the matter? You feel all right? He lied. He said he loved me. He lied to me. Don't feel hurt, lady. He lied to everybody. The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Walter Baker, alias Walter Tracy, was tried and convicted on three counts of first-degree burglary and received the maximum sentence prescribed by law. He is now serving out his term in the state penitentiary. A hold has been placed on him by the state of Oregon, where he will serve out seven years for violation of parole. Billy Crawford, Baker's accomplice, was tried and convicted of receiving stolen property and is now serving time in the state penitentiary for women. You have just heard the 11th in a new series of authentic cases transcribed from official police files. Technical advice for Dragnet is furnished by the Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Warden Clarence A. Larkin of Folsom Prison, Sacramento, who, on the evening of September 24th, 1937, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. If you enjoyed tonight's production of Dragnet, you'll want to listen this Saturday evening to a pair of adventure shows featuring two well-known Hollywood personalities. You'll enjoy Brian Donlevy, star of Dangerous Assignment. Also on Saturday's schedule is Richard Diamond, private detective, as played by the screen's romantic tough guy, Dick Powell. Listen to both of these exciting programs this Saturday over most of these same NBC stations. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Big 
music and the big trouble and the big plenty. So when they ask you, tell them this one's about the blues. Pete Kelly's blues. Kelly's Blues, starring Jack Webb, with story by Joe Eisinger and music by Dick Ketner. My name's Pete Kelly. I play cornet. You'll find us at 417 Cherry Street, Kansas City. It's a standard speakeasy. Before Prohibition, the building housed the cleaning and dyeing plant. It hasn't changed much. The vats came in handy. It's still tough to get a clear gin, but a lady likes the idea of a drink to match the color of her dress. The lease is owned by George Lupo. He's a fat, funded little guy who wouldn't harm a fly. There's no money in harming flies. We start every night about ten and play till the customers get that first frightening look at each other in the early light. Lupo's working on a scheme to push the dawn back for at least one more hour. I don't think he'll make it, but I wouldn't want to risk a buck against him. The last night, everything was routine until I saw her again. We were just winding up the third set when she came in, flanked by the same deadpan gunsel. She sat alone at the same table, ordered the same drink, smoked the same Egyptian deities, and gave me that same loving look. The gunsel, as usual, nibbled at his drink at the bar and his eyes playing watchdog for the girl. This was the fifth night, four nights running, same girl, same gunsel, same routine. Sit for five solid hours, drink, smoke, and work me over with her eyes, reach down deep for a sigh, and leave with deadpan right behind her. Well, I didn't like it. I was beginning to taste salt on my tongue. We went into a finish, and the girl looked once at the gunsel. He nodded, left the bar, and started to the stand. All right. Nick, can you push it a little? It helps when we can hear the beat. All right, don't audition for me. Just do it, huh? Pete. Yeah, Red. That babe's here again. I know, I know. All right, what do we got up next? Working up ahead of steam, Pete. Well, she's beginning to make me feel like a wayside shrine. You. Who? You. Me? Yeah. Oh, you got a request? A number you'd like no, to... No, I got no request, but the lady, she's got a request. The lady? What's the matter? You don't see the lady? How come you don't see the lady when she's looking right at you? Oh, that lady, yeah, sure, I see the lady. Well, why do you make like you don't see the lady when all the time you know the lady's looking right at you? Look, friend, I'm only a poor underpaid employee in this trap. Now, my contract says I'm to play music to please the patrons. I'd be very happy to do anything the lady likes to please the lady. So, all right. So what does she want me to do? So she wants you to have a drink with her. Sure, that'd be an honor. But I'm afraid that Mr. Lupo, he's my boss, you know. George Lupo, the proprietor, he doesn't like his employees to mingle I with I will the... talk to Lupo, he'll like it. Yeah, you could probably make him love it. Come on. I'll be right back, Red. Use some nickel. Right, Petey. Peter, this is Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kelly, this is Vita Brand. Sit down, Mr. Kelly. Yeah, thanks. All right now, Vita? You happy? I'm getting happier by the minute. Sure, you, you want me to go back to the bar? But here, it's more friendly. Hello, Pete. Hello, Miss Brand. Vita. Vita? You like my name? Sure, sure, it's beautiful. Vita. I only just got it last week. Well, take a little time to break it in, huh? Let me hear you say it. Vita. Yeah. I like the way you say it. Like you mean it. Yeah, I do. I never meant anything more in my life. That's because you're sincere. I knew you were sincere the first time I looked at you. Remember the first night I came in? Sat here and looked at you. Yeah, well, I'm pretty busy up there, you know. Ain't such a wink since that night. Well, maybe if you go home and put your mind to it, huh? No use, Pete. I tried. Nothing's any good. Nothing I can do is going to change it. Change what? The way I feel. Sick? Yeah. With what? With love. Oh, poor Vita. Yeah, well, beautiful girl like you, no trouble finding another man. I don't want another man. I don't want another man. I want you. That's what Vita wants, you. I love you, Pete. Yeah, sure. Well, that's the way it ought to be. Everybody love everybody else. It's a better world. Well, I got a number to do. I... You. Now you shut up. The lady is trying to tell you how much she loves you, so pay attention. Yeah. First time I saw you, Pete, hit me like a dumb dumb bullet. Well, excuse me. I have to earn a buck. Frame it. It's the last one you'll have to earn. <clears throat> All right. Let's do one. What do you got up? Still with me again? All right. Pete. Yeah, Red. That babe, I got the rumble on her from Lupo. Yeah. Ever hear of a citizen named Bacalides? The three for boy? 
three killings for the price of two. All right, Red, funnel it down, huh? She belongs to Bacalides loser, Petey, loser. Yeah, you told me what, now tell me how. Well, let's try one. Let's do it till we meet again. All right, we'll make a slow intro out of the last eight. We'll go back to the top, Nick. You take the first four going in. Everybody got it? Yes. All right. Let's try it. Come on, let's all play it, huh? All right, once more. Nervous, Petey? No, I'm not nervous. Now, come on, everybody, once more. Heading this way again. Yeah, I know. What do we got up next? Blue, sweet little you, and in addition, one star. Sure. Now, look, friend, I got a job You're to do. You're it. Let's go. Where? Now, you listen, Buster. This ain't a lollipop poking you in the gut. I can drop you and be out of here before you hit the floor. Yeah. Let's go. Well, we went outside. The Hispano out in front probably wasn't as long as it looked. We've got fairly short blocks in this part of town. Vita took the wheel. She banked low around the corner, pulled out of a half Immelman, gained a little altitude, and flew blind for downtown Kansas City. Vita glanced at me from the corners of charged eyes. It just glanced at me. I leaned my head back and closed my eyes. The Hispano whipped down Main Street, lost altitude as we gained the deserted financial district, made a perfect no-point landing at the side entrance of the Grundy Bank and Savings. Well, we went into the bank through the family entrance. One light was burning, and it hung low over the biggest dice table I ever saw in any bank. The stick man was busier than a flea on a fat lady. He called the plays and called the points, and not one of the 50 torpedoes glanced at us as we climbed a short flight to an upstairs office. Two men were in the room. One, a shadow dressed in dark clothes, looked through a small window onto the dice game down below. The Tommy gun rested easy across his knees. The other man sat behind a desk no bigger than the loading platform at Union Station. He was counting money. Neat orderly piles of bills were stacked around him like a well-trimmed hedge. We waited while he finished thumbing a book of 50s. He just held him up to his ear, fanned him once, made a note on a pad by his elbow. Finally, he turned his swivel chair to face us. He was all chin and jaw. He leaned back, made a church steeple with his fingers, threw me a credit manager's smile, and rocked his chair gently to and fro. Well, come in, Mr. Kelly. Sit down. You're among friends. Yeah, thanks. Pete, permit me to introduce you to this here gentleman here who's very fond of you. Sure, everybody loves me tonight. Oh, he doesn't love you. <laughs> Only I love you. He's really very fond of you. I am back to lead you. Yeah. <laughs> he's confused. Ain't he cute? Ain't he cute when he's confused? What is your confusion? How much time do you have? I'm at your disposal. 
Well, now, look, it runs something like this, Mr. Bacalides. I play cornet, see? At 417, I mind my own business. I try not to poke a thumb in anybody's eye. Well, I noticed this young lady here sitting out front, and tonight she asked me to have a drink with her. Well, naturally, I'm flattered. Yes, but, you yes, know... I know all this, but what is your confusion? Well, it seems that this young lady here has a... Well, some kind of an idea that she sort of likes me and... Loves you, Mr. Kelly. Yeah, well, loves me like you say. Well, I don't figure myself for no Rudolph Valentino, so I get an idea that it's a rib, you know, and especially since I know how... Well, how she... How both of you... Not both. One. Me, I love Vita very much. Oh, darling, you're sweet. Yeah, that's right, for a fact. And when Vita thinks it over, I'm sure There's she's nothing go... more to think over, Mr. Kelly. Vita has stopped loving me, all right? I face it. It makes me very unhappy, but I face it. Now, she loves you. She wants you. I know how unhappy this can make her. I do not like for Vita to be unhappy, so Vita and me, we talk it over. We decide you will marry Vita. Thank you, darling. You're sweet. There's nothing, Vita. You know how I will do anything to make you happy, anything. All right, now how about doing something to make me a little happy, huh? But I give you Vita. Yeah, well, I pass. You refuse? Oh, Pete, you don't mean that. You have made Vita cry. I do not like to see Vita <laughs> cry. Tell her you do not mean that. Goodbye, friend. I got a number to do at 417, and it ain't here comes the bride. It's... Yeah. Pick him up. On your feet. You will ask Vita to be your wife. What's the next best offer? Itch, don't hurt him. I won't. All right, Itch. I think Mr. Kelly wants to say something. Yeah. Kelly. Huh? Who am I? Huh? You hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Whiskey. Put him in that chair. Come on, boy. Hold his head back. All right, he's fine now. Yeah. All I need is a few kind words. I will give them to you. Just repeat after me. Vida, I love you. Vida, I love you. Mean it. Vida, I love you. Oh, Pete. Will you marry me? Will you marry me? Oh, darling, of course I will. Congratulations. We drink to it. To the happy bride and groom. Long life. Long life. Long life. Yeah. Now, here's how. Tomorrow afternoon, you and Vida will marry in City Hall. It will be best man. Then you go on a nice long honeymoon and drive to Canada in my Hispano, which I give Vita for a wedding present. Look, I got a job here in town, 417 Cherry. Go back to that crib. Tell the boss you quit. Tear up your cornet. I'm loaded, Pete. Loaded. All right. Here's a pound of fifties. Tomorrow morning, you buy some clean clothes, top to bottom, inside and out. You will meet Vita at City Hall, 2 o'clock. Here's a key to the Hispano. Take it. Now kiss Vita goodnight. Yeah. Good night, Angel. I'll be the happiest bride in the world. Sure. And you'll be the happiest bridegroom. Yeah, for the saddest step. Well, I left the office inside the spin of a top. The Hispano stood by the curb, sleek and calm, just like nothing had happened. Nothing at all. Well, I pointed for the 12th Street Bridge, made the other side of the river, and set a course down Boulder Road for Fat Annie's place. Oh, I tried to imagine life with Vita Brand. And then I thought of six painless ways of committing suicide. And I began to feel better. Fat Annie's place was doing a fair business for the lull hours. Maggie Jackson was standing back by the piano. I groped my way to the bar, ordered a bromo and ammonia, and listened. All right. For the wealthy gentleman from Detroit. He needs me. All right, Ray. But he needs me And so no matter where he goes Though he doesn't care Congratulations. What's for? Let's get back here. I want you to be the first to know. In here. Pete, who 
Who worked you over? You ever hear of a nail named Vita Brand? Vita? Why, she don't weigh hardly enough to beat the white of an egg. What do you know about her, Maggie? Nothing much for sure. Only she's back a lady's package, and that makes her a package nobody tampers with. Nobody. Yeah, nobody but me. Not if you love life, you don't. I gotta. Who says? Back a lady says. Petey, you all right? Till tomorrow, two o'clock, yeah. What's then? Then's the wedding. Who? Mine, and Vita Brand. Petey, you've gone simple for sure. You know what back a lady's will do to you? Look, Maggie, I just left back a lady's and Vita. He catch you with her? Look, that way I'm healthy. If he catches me without her, I'm dead in my socks. Petey, you're taking those risks too fast. Slow it down a little. Bacalita, he's just crazy about that woman. Remember Albino Artie? He once looked at Vita like Bacalita didn't buy. That was six or seven weeks ago. You seen Albino Artie for the past six or seven weeks? No, nobody has. Well, hear this. Bacalita's orders me to marry Vita at two o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Now square it for me. Why? Hey, Vita, what does she say about this? Only that she loves me. She tell that to Bacalita? Right to his platinum teeth. Oh, I'm getting that feeling, Petey, like my grandmother used to get. And what's it tell you? That Vita's preparing herself to be a bride and a widow both in the same day. Yeah. Well, I better move. You do that, Pete. Fast and far. So long, Maggie. I will. And if I were you, I wouldn't stop moving until I heard him speak in foreign languages. Well, marry Vita and I'm a dead bridegroom. Don't marry Vita, I'm a dead bachelor. Well, I decided to try to be a live fugitive. I raced the Hispano back across the river, pulled up sharp in front of 417 Cherry. The brakes never made a sound. Lupo was pounding the cash register with both fists. He threw the usual glare at me as I pushed through to the bandstand. Hold it down, huh? Hold it down. Let's do this one real fine, for me. It's my last time around. See? Yeah, Red. You being pushed out? Yeah, it's that or carried out. All right. Let's do singing the blues, huh? Everybody ready? Yep. All right, here we go. I got to take care of. Well, you'll hear from me, so just keep at it right here until... Red? Yeah, see? In the alley, huh? Uh-huh. Look, Red, I'm in a jam. What can I do to help you? Thanks, but nothing. I got to keep moving. Maybe cool off in a couple of weeks. Maybe not. Meantime, try to keep the boys together, huh? Sure. Well, it 
wasn't easy. I was going to miss the boys. I missed Red already. No, it wasn't easy. But there was only one exit. I drove around to the rooming house, raced up the stairs. All I had to take was a clean shirt, my other suit, and my book of arrangements. I'd hightail it east, just keep rolling till I ran out of road. That was the plan, until I got to my room. She was stretched across my bed, and she looked right at me as I came in. And there she was, on my bed, looking right at me, but I was all alone. Now Vita would never be anybody's widow. She was too dead to say I do. The stocking from her left leg was where no girl's stocking ought to be, knotted tightly around her throat. Well, I tiptoed back to the door, as though she was a light sleeper. I closed the door very gently behind me, and then I raced down the three flights into the street, into the Hispano, and into high speed. There was no lambing out of this one. You just don't hit the road in a car belonging to the stiff you leave behind. For such violations, the law is strict. Also, back of ladies. Well, I pulled up hard in front of Sour Sammy's joint. This time, the brakes cried. Bonnie Ricketts was sitting at his usual table in his usual state, boiled and loud. Bonnie's the only ex-bootlegger in the country who went broke in 1922. He says he did that to aggravate a couple of prohibition agents he hated. Well, Barney saw me come in and waved me over to his table. Ah, Pete Kelly. Welcome, Petey, and have a drink. Look, Barney, I'm up to my eyes. Nonsense, Petey. You haven't even opened them yet. Ah, here we are. A drink for you and a drink for me. Now, listen, Barney, I'm in trouble. Petey, I have suddenly become oppressed by the state of the world. Well, it's my own fault, Petey, my own fault. I make it a rule never to look at the public prints. But tonight, well, uh, just listen to these few choice items. Now, look, Barney, right now I'm a moving target for Bacalidi's gun. Last night's edition of the Star. Look here, Petey, September 8, 1923. Girl forced to leap from stranger's automobile. But let us remember, Petey, that the only girls who leap from stranger's automobiles are those who climb into them. And here, uh, look here. All right, Barney. California politicians say they are responsible for President Calvin Coolidge's success, Probably insists, Petey, that it's in honor of their state that he's called Cal. And this, Petey... Barney, look, there's a dead girl in my room. German Mark quoted at 28 cents per million. So you see, Petey, even a German millionaire is pushed hard to feel like 30 cents. Now look, Vita Brand, back a lady's girl, she's dead, Barney, in my room. Well, now, that's most careless of you, Petey. If I run, it's the law, Barney. If I stand still, it's back a lady's. How did you get mixed up with Vita Brand and Bacalidi? I don't know. I'm still in last week's fog. She wanted to marry me. Bacalidi said I would or else. Why, Barney? Why if he talked for it? Very simple problem in human relationships, Petey. Tonight, the word got out that Muggsy Brand was sprung. Who's Muggsy Brand? Peter's father. He was sent up last year. Peter is his whole life. He tried to guard her like Lupo guards his cash register. He hates back a lady, and if he learned that he and Peter... Yeah, yeah, now it's coming into focus. Sometimes, Peter, you're dull-witted. Dull-witted, but stupid. So back a lady's and Peter rig it to disarm her old man. She marries me, takes the heat off back a lady. Splendid, Peter, splendid. And her old man winds up throwing a knife at me. All I gotta do now is explain Peter's body in my room to Muggsy Brand. Precisely what Bacalides expects you to face. All right. Do the rest of it together for me, will you? Bacalides is married. He could never square himself with Vita. He got in deeper than he wanted to. Mm. He couldn't dump her because of Muggsy coming out. So he ties her onto you, gets her up to your room, leaves her dead on your bed. How do I back out of this one, Barney? Do you know where to reach Bacalides? Yeah, at the Grundy Bank. He's dice game? Yeah, that's right. All right, go there. See back your lady. Lay it on the line for him. All the way, just like we talked in here. Well, they'll cut me down. You might. How much edge do I have? Not quite enough to shave with. But maybe just enough to cut my throat, huh? It's your only chance, Pete. You're in the middle of a three-way push. The law, back your lady, Muggsy Brand. All right, Barney. I'm counting on you on the outside. Don't worry, Petey. I'll be there with bells on. Yeah, make sure they don't toll for me. Well, I went back to the Grundy Bank in savings. I had no trouble getting in. The game was just heating up. I stalled around the dark edges of the table for a minute and laid a few bucks on the field. Upstairs, the light was on in the office. The boy with the big piece was still sitting at the window. I could see the head and shoulders of Bacalides. He was still counting money. I started slowly up the stairs, went into the room without knocking. The muscle man swung sharp, pointing the heater at my stomach. Bacalides, fast for a big man, flung out a hand and knocked the gun out of line. Hold it! Next time, knock, or you pick up a lot of weight. Yeah, or a silk stocking around my neck? No, for you, a knife. From the fingers of the best shiv man in the country. Muggsy Brand? Don't try to run, Kelly. He likes a moving target. Just go to him. Tell him his daughter is in your bed, a stocking around her throat. Tell him you don't understand any of it. He will be very sympathetic. Well, that's nice, Mr. Bacalini. You set it up real nice. <laughs> Smart, huh? Sure. You persuade Vita to buzz it around that I'm number one. Everything's fixed for her father's ears. Even get her to help you push her across by going up to my room. You tell a good story, friend. Maybe too good. I'll put that rod down, Bacalini, before you drop it and break your toe. Maxie, take him downstairs. Come back alone. Petey, look out. Get down. Muggsy. Barney, you all right? Shell shock. Mm. Mm. Muggsy, Bram. 
Yes, Pete. I knew where he was. All he heard was Bacalides. Kelly. Yeah, Munzee. Bacalides. I got him? He was between the guns. Not much left of him. Or his trigger man. Or me. Now listen. My coat. Money. Take it. My kid a good burial. Easy, Muggsy. Huh? She was only a kid. Maybe if she met a guy like... He's gone, Pete. Yeah. What do you mean, Pete? A guy like who? Who knows, Barney? Who knows? Proceeding was transcribed. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. There's another thrilling adventure in store for you tonight with Les Damon as the hard-hitting adventurer known as the Falcon. Later, hear the best in music, the tunes which America is singing. Yes, we bring you a sparkling new program devoted to the best in popular music and presided over by well-known musical director Meredith Wilson. Tonight, make a listening reminder to hear Meredith Wilson's music room. Les Damon as the Falcon, tonight on NBC. The following is transcribed. No, it isn't. The following is transcribed. No, it isn't. Oh, yes, it is. It is not. Yes, it is. It is not. It is, too. It is not. It is. It isn't. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. The following is not transcribed. This week, the Major League Baseball season opened. In keeping with this, the American Broadcasting Company brings you the first foul ball of the season. It's the Jack Webb Show in its fifth consecutive strikeout. Nothing new has been added. The Ragged Airs will play tonight, but without their director, Phil Bavaro, who only confused the men anyway. That spiritual singer, Clancy Hayes, of the firm of Haig and Haig and Hayes, will conduct his usual contest with the orchestra. She's young, she's pretty, she sings. That's three runs for our side, vocalist Nora McNamara. John Galbraith, an Oakland boy, and the only argument we can think of against the Bay Bridge, will play rats and second lieutenants and spooky people, and, oh yes, a wonderful gal with a wonderful voice has made a terrible mistake tonight. Midge Williams has agreed to set a career back ten years with a guest appearance on the Jack Webb Show. <laughs> My name is Jordan, and I'm going to find a nice, quiet room until this thing blows over. Why don't you do the same? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, how are all our listeners out there? Both of you. Uh, John Galbraith, put your glasses on so you can find the microphone and come on over here, will you? Oh, Jack, my, my, my boy, that's certainly a healthy crop of freckles you picked up in the San Francisco sunshine. What do you mean, freckles? Those are the holes in the microphone. Put them on, put them <laughs> on, will you? Yeah. <laughs> hey, of course, how stupid of me, Jack. Your head doesn't say ABC on it, does it? <laughs> Neither do yours, John. Don't we have a grand studio audience here tonight, John? Do you know who these boys are? Who are the girls? Finally got those... <laughs> oh, you finally got those glasses on, huh, John? Well, these men are 200 Army patients from Letterman General Hospital here in San Francisco. And most of them have only been in this country four days. Some of them even one day. Uh... <laughs> Jack, who are the girls? I think we ought to have some ruffles and flourishes for the generals here tonight. Who are the girls? Welcome home, generals. Who 
are the girls? <laughs> the girls, John. Oh, say. Yes. There's 75 hostesses from the Oak Street USO. Aren't they, though? Yeah, well, I guess we ought to have some ruffles and flourishes for them, too, you know? Yeah. They've already got the uh, ruffles. Let's just have the flourishes, shall we? <laughs> that is the first time that those guys have ever gotten together since we went on the air. I don't <laughs> Presenting a page torn from the private files of Slim Slade, Western band leader. We return to the little western town of Howdyville, where a group of citizens are talking. Howdyville, nobody quite knows how it got its name. Howdy, 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 Slim Slade, just a poor old cow poke, out on the plains of Howdyville. Hey, Slim, what you doing out there? Oh, just poking around the cows. Well, come on over here. Got a letter for you with a city writing on it. Letter with city writing? Hmm? Didn't know nobody I knowed could write. Don't make no difference, though. I can't read. Well, you don't, you don't have to, Slim. I done read it. Oh, well, what does it say? Oh, it don't say nothing, Slim. It's just a letter. Well, I don't mean talk say. I mean read say. Well, why don't you talk say what you mean say? Yeah. It's from your brother. Oh, that's Slick. Mm, that's right. Sign Slick Slade. Wait a minute. Wait just a minute. I'm going to get the boys. Hey, weasel, fox, and snake. Sounds like a zoo, don't it? Come on over here, boys. Hey, anybody seen Enchilada Gomez? See, Slade, I'm over here taking a little fiesta. That's siesta. See. Come on over here, boys. Well, howdy, Slim. Howdy, 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 howdy. <laughs> See, uh, I got a letter from a brother in Hawaii. Slim, I, I believe that's pronounced Hawaii. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I never was much good in them European names. <laughs> Go ahead, Weasel. Here's the letter. Yeah, Weasel. What do it say? Why, don't say nothing, Slim. It's just a letter. Well, well I don't mean talk say. I mean read say. Why don't you talk say what you mean say? <laughs> it's from your brother. Doggone, I know that. Well, the letter says... I thought you... Quiet, Slim. Dear friend brother, I'm making lots of money. I never knowed when I left Fort Worth there was so doggone much money in the world. I'm making... Lots of money. Doggone, brother. Doggone, brother. Money's one thing I got plenty of. Like Mark said, money can't buy friends. But who wants friends when you got this much money? <laughs> Doggone, brother. Sure must have struck it rich. Doggone, brother. I sure struck it rich. <laughs> I'm making plenty of money. I got myself a Western band, and we play Western music. That's a novelty. And we're all making lots of money over here in Hawaii. <laughs> we call the Western band Slick Slade and his Hilo Hilo Monsters. <laughs> that is all for now on account of 
I have run out of gold paper, which I write on, and besides, my 24 karat diamond pinpoint done bust. Your friend, your brother, Slick. P. Uh, S. <laughs> uh, sure am making lots of money. <laughs> brother Slick is right. We're going to do the same thing. We're all going to organize a Western band. Good idea, Slim. See, si, Slim, I think we better do it banana. That's manana. Si. Come on, saddle up, boys. We're going to ride to New York. I'm going to write the tunes on the way. All right, boys, come on, come on, move in. We're going to rehearse a spell. Now, here's a tune I read. Music and notes by me. It's called... Oh, this will kill you. When it's apple blossom time in Fort Worth. Oh, that's awful pretty, Slim. Yeah, ain't it? Mm-hmm. Right. Now let's play it through once. You ready on the drums, Enchilada? I want plenty of drums in this. All right, you ready, boys? Here we go. Play it just like she was wrote. Everybody set? Hey, Slim, what's all these little black spots all over this paper? I was wondering about that, too, Slim. Seems to me you could have got clean paper. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, as long as you was a paying for it. Them's notes. Them's what you play. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Now, come on. Here we go. I'm on count three. Are you ready? Put her in half. I'll stop my foot three times. Get set now. It's going to come fast. You got to be ready. Let's play it just like she was wrote. Don't leave nothing out. It's all good. If you get lost, keep it going. Don't go straggling all over this song like a doggy. <laughs> come on. Relax. Tighten up. Smile. Frown. Because you're going to enjoy this one. Steady in the saddle. I'm counting. One... To hold it, hold it, boys, I better tell you. We're going to start this number on three. You got that, boys, or you want to write it down? <laughs> Here we go. One, two, hold it, hold it. I guess I better announce our name just like we're going to do it uptown. Present Slim Slade and his makes you want to dance when they're playing a hoedown and just sit down and cry when they're playing a sad one. Western band. You think that name's too long? Well, all right, here we go. Real down-to-earth music right out of the dirt. Put her in half. Well, let's go. One, two, hit it. Oh, I forgot I was supposed to say the number three. Hold it, hold it, boys, hold it. Hold it. You've done right good on that one. You've done right good on... Well, it's Apple Blossom Time in Fort Worth. Now, i got another one I want to try. Music and notes by me. It's called Horsefly Pie and Apple Pan Howdy. <laughs> All right, boys. One, two, take it. Oh, God, I always forget to say three. <laughs> hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. That's mighty pretty, ain't it? Which one of those you like the best? Well, never mind. I got another one here I want to try. Music and notes by me. This is a sad one, boys. It's a prison song. It's called, I Might As Well Be Sprung. <laughs> Okay, let's do her. One, two, take her. Now, why didn't I say three? <laughs> hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Boys, boys, I gotta say, you sure are versatile. Them three of the prettiest tunes I ever did here. Now, I think we're all ready to go. But before we do, I got one more tune I'd like to try. Music and notes by me. I call this one, Bang, 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 Went My Six Gun. That's pretty, ain't it? Kind of knocked the lightning. All right, boys. One, two, play it. Now, what happened to three? Slim Slade and his western band. First, it's the Pennsylvania roof. Then the Wedgwood room of the Waldorf. Carnegie Hall, millions of phonograph records, radio coast to coast. Yes, Slim Slade and his band had arrived on the musical scene. And then, one day, disaster. Boys, I got sad news. They tied the can to us. We're through. We've been fired plumb out of New York. Oh, what's the trouble, Slim? Well, the manager of that there radio station told me tonight that we wasn't versatile enough. Said all our tunes sounded alike. I don't know how he figured that. We got 47 tunes. All of them got different names. Music and notes by me. Come on, boys. Pick up your instruments. Let's play a couple of them numbers and see what that fella's talking about. All right. The go down, hold down. That's good, that's good. Hey, wait a minute. Hold it just a minute. Them drums ain't quite loud enough, Enchilada. A little of that melody sneaked through in one place. Okay, more drums this time, and let's hear the Gila Monster Waltz. Okay. Now I want to 
want to hear one more. I want to hear, oh, you beautiful Texas. This is pretty. Like All right, now, now, listen. Now, let's go back. Let's do a little reviewing. Let's go way back. Let's hear our first hit, the tune that brung us here. Well, it's apple blossom time in Fort Worth. <laughs> okay, boys. Oh, that no, no. That fella don't know what he's talking about. Them's four of the prettiest tunes I ever heard. But we're going back to Texas. I'm plum played out. I ain't got another tune in me. I'm just like that, that fella, Irvine Berlin. Only he's got someone to help him with them lyrics. I got to write the notes myself. Saddle up, boys. We're all through. We're going back to poking cows. If we stay here any longer, we're going to get in a rut. Sure is good being back in Texas, ain't it? Yeah, I don't miss that Pennsylvania roof, none. Fellow by the name of Benny Goodman done moved in after us. Who's he? Oh, here comes Slim now. Well, howdy, Slim Slim. Howdy, 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 howdy. Saddle up, boys. We're going back to New York. I've done it again. We got it this time. I wrote a new tune. Music and notes by me, boys. Get this. This is going to be a snapper, this title. It's called When It's Apple Blossom Time in Corpus Christi. <laughs> Baby don't care for clothes. My baby don't care for shows. My baby just cares for me. My baby don't care for silks and laces. My baby don't care for high tone places. My baby don't care for rings and other expensive things. She's sensible as can be. My baby don't care who knows it. My baby just cares for me. care for shows, my baby just cares for me, my baby don't care for silks and laces, my baby don't care for high tone places, my baby don't care for rings and other expensive things, she's sensible as can be. My baby don't care who knows it. My baby just cares for me. Inside Hollywood. Presenting Hollywood's own beloved, sweet, darling, pretty, vivacious, lovable... Ah, yes. Brunella Carsons. Miss Carsons. Thank you, ugly boy. Good evening, all my friends here in movie land. Tonight, instead of my usual dribble... Hmm, must be a typographical error. They must mean trivia. I'm speaking to you from the sound stages of stupendous pictures, and I want you to look in with me. Shall we be off? Quiet! Quiet on the set! Quiet! Somebody's 
still breathing. <laughs> Where's my assistant director, Rodney Reel? Oh, yes, sir. Did, 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 did you want me to? <laughs> Reel, you're all wound up. Remember, I'm a busy, busy, busy man directing this picture. Of course, Monty. As far as I'm concerned, Reel, you're just about run out. Now... <laughs> Now, what did I tell you to call me on the set? You mean uh, what the experts call you? No, no, not that. <laughs> oh, oh. You know. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, Montague Close Up Muldoon, uh, Director Supreme of Stupendous Pictures, Incorporated. Hmm. Well, you can leave off the Incorporated when we're among friends. I'm a busy, busy, busy man. This is no B picture, you know. Have we spent any money lately? We spent $40,000 just 10 minutes ago. I said lately. What'd you spend it for, Reel? A bathing suit for the leading lady. This is no B picture. Give me that checkbook. I'm going to write out a check for another forty thousand. Let's get both pieces of that bathing suit. It's indecent. <laughs> Reel, have I told you lately that I'm a busy, 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 busy man? Uh, yes, Mister Busy. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Mister Muldoon. Now, about this army picture, Mister Muldoon. I want to tell you something. Listen, Real. You can't tell me anything about the Army. I know that outfit from A to Z. I was a full colonel in this war, and I spent the entire duration in Washington, D.C. <laughs> now, what about that desert scene? Well, we're having difficulty finding a desert big enough to hold 2,000 troop transports. Now, listen. If MacArthur... <laughs> if MacArthur could afford to use... A thousand troop transports. Stupendous pictures can afford to use two thousand. But there's no desert big enough. Well, I told you to buy Death Valley. <laughs> if you don't hurry, they'll start a housing project out there. <laughs> Real? You slipped your spool for the last time with me. <laughs> I'm taking over the entire production of this picture personally. I promised the Secretary of War that this army picture would be ready three days ago. I'll keep that promise. Yes, Mr. Muldoon. Have you got that explosion scene ready? Yes, sir. Well. The bomb men have been working on it for two weeks. I think you'll like it. Well, let's have it. This picture's costing me a million dollars a day. Well, Mr. Muldoon, I, I... I don't see a drop of water out here anywhere. But, Mr. Muldoon... I told you to flood this entire desert under 26 feet of water. <laughs> now, what are we going to do with Esther Williams? In this picture, she won't swim. <laughs> well, in this picture, she just won't swim. She'll have to ride a camel, that's all. By the way, I don't see those camels anywhere. But, Mr. Muldoon... I suppose you're going to tell me that you forgot. You forgot a little thing like... 30,000 camels. Oh, oh. Mr. Muldoon, there is something that this army picture I've been trying to tell you. Well, about. real, you're all mixed up. I know what you mean, though. Is this what you call a crowd? I asked for 100,000 Arabs, but do I get them? No, there's practically nobody out there. Looks like a group of Republicans lined up to vote. <laughs> uh, Mr. Muldoon, I've been thinking... Impossible. Where's the telephone? Why? Why, I'll tell you why. I want a crowd out there. I'm going to call Washington. Mr. Truman's the only one that's got 100,000 men not doing anything. Well, Mr. Muldoon, there's no telephone way out here in the desert. No, who says so? When Muldoon wants a telephone, Muldoon gets a telephone. Why, there's probably one hanging right here on this banana tree. By the way, Real, where are those banana trees? <laughs> well, never mind. You've got a nickel? Uh, here you are, Mr. Muldoon. Five cents. Well, hmm. Picture's costing us a lot of money. Hello. What number did I dial? Well, how should I know what number I dialed? I'm a busy, busy, busy man. Give me the White House. No, I won't wait. I want the White House. I'm a busy, busy, busy man. Hello, White House? I want to talk to you know who. 
Busy, busy. Yeah, he's busy. I'll call later. Mr. Muldoon, there's something about this army picture you ought to know. Reel, you're off the track again. Have I fired you today? No, Mr. Muldoon. I haven't? You're fired! Well, I'll be a second lieutenant. <laughs> Places, everybody. Hurry up, hurry up. It's going to take all day for 300,000 people to get set. You, you back there, stop blinking your eyes. Now, when I give the signal, all 300,000 of you Arabs run out into that clearing in the desert. Now, the army planes, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, 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 they're up there circling around. All right. Had a signal from me, they'll swoop down and strafe you. They're using real bullets, so be careful. <laughs> If any of you get mowed down, don't worry. You won't spoil the scene. This is only a rehearsal. Mr. Muldoon, I just came out to tell you the picture is finished. It is? Well, that's fine. All you Arabs out there, you can all go home. This army picture is finished. There's only one thing wrong, Mr. Muldoon. Well, what's that, real? What I've been trying to tell you all along. This picture was not ordered by the Secretary of War. It wasn't? No. No, that letter was from the Secretary of the Navy... This army picture was supposed to be a navy picture. It's the blues. It's Midge Williams. Out on a plane down near Santa Fe, I met a cowboy riding the range one day, and as he jumped along, I heard him singing the most peculiar cowboy song. It was a ditty, he learned in the ditty. Come to I, I, yeah, come to I, I, you by getting along. Dead hip, little dog, get along. Better be on your way, get along. Dead hip, little doggy, and he trucked him on down the old fairway. Singing his cow, cow, boogie in the strangest way. Come to I, I, yeah, come to I, it's the I, Singing his cowboy song, he's just too much. He's got a knock on western accent with a collar. He was raised on local weed. He's what you call a thing half free. Singing his cow cow boogie in the strangest way. Come at the I I A. Come at the F B I A. Why get along? Get hit, little doggy, get along. Better be on your way, get along. Get hit, little doggy, and he trucked him on down the old fairway. Singing his cow cow boogie in the strangest way. Come to I, I, yeah, come to I, it's the I, yeah. Singing his cow boy song. He's just too much. He's got a north side western accent with that hard and cut. He was raised on a local weed. He's what you call a swing half free. Singing his cow cow boogie in the strangest way. Come to I, I, yeah. Come to I, it's the I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Come to I, I, it's the I, yeah. Stand by, here's the news you've been waiting all week to hear. Here's the news thousands of you want to hear. Folks, he's talking about the results of our ginger peachy contest announced last week. Remember, we told you to write a letter on the subject, how to get the Jack Webb show off the air. Didn't work, did it? Mm. Well, John, clean your glasses and read the winning letter. Here it is, Jack. In part, it says, I read from the letter, quote, chapter one entitled, The Process of Air Fumigation, or how to get the Jack Webb show off the air. The solution is to have each person in the country take deeper and more breaths, and it won't be long until all the air is used up, and then there will be no air for Webb to be on. Hmm. 
How silly. And it's signed, Betty Ford, Pyramid Court, Sparks, Nevada. Congratulations, Miss Ford. Mm, I hate you, Miss Ford. But enough of these pats in the back for Miss Ford. She wants to know what she's won. By the way, what did she win? Oh, boy, she won. And how what she won? Well, what did she win? Well, uh, Nora McNamara will just put that geometry book away for a minute and come up here. John, you don't mean we're giving Nora away. No, 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 well, no. Nora has the prize. And oh, here it is. my, my, look at that thing, a king-size egg. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> what is that, John? It's a genuine ostrich egg laid Ooh. fresh this morning from the California ostrich farm in Southern California. Yes, friends, this is a Hollywood egg. <laughs> yes, sir, this ostrich egg has been autographed by all members of the cast, including John Galbraith, who makes his usual act. Oh, and it has been lacquered and placed on a solid wooden base. And all this, with our best wishes, will be shipped Air Express to the winner of this week's contest, Betty Ford, Sparks, Nevada. Well, right now... <laughs> Tonight's egg was laid by the Ragged Airs. Clancy Hayes reads the stage against us with a vocal. Miss Williams' as guest stars teed off on a couple of songs. John Galbraith and Ethel Sterling missed their cues. Dick Breen glued the joints together. And this is Jack Webb. Give us another chance next Wednesday night at 9.30, will you? Good night, gang. See you then.